Okay, like all these videos, greetings, brothers and sisters. Like all these videos, there was a weird turn. I was going to make this mostly about the Olympics and the tie back to the 1984 Los Angeles alien and all these things where you see these guys pictured here. And I get to that at the end of the video. And I had all this other stuff, interesting things about the political whatever, you know, all these. I mean, every day it's interesting. But then Elon Musk and Trump had an interview. There's some other stuff here. So I cover it all here today. Um, you know, I think it's all kind of important. <laughs> A little bit wiped out. Uh, but here's the video. Okay. Um, greetings, brothers and sisters. So my wife and I just watched the movie The Jones Plantation. Kind of interesting movie to watch. It's a kind of low-budget truther movie we watched on Amazon. Uh, but it's well done. It's It seems like it's about slavery, but it's just about the current system and moving from regular slavery, slavery to debt-based slavery, right? I found it interesting, and, you know, there's this attitude that I want to talk about here. I mean, they did a good job with the movie. But there's a problem with this truther mentality, right? And so... The majority of the people who are truthers, and this is probably, I mean, there's, you know, varying levels. There's whatever you want to call a truther. People who, there's one level of being a truther. It's everyone who doesn't believe in the official story. I mean, most people don't trust the media completely or the government completely, right? But there's a certain level where you're like, yeah, they're just lying all the time. And you, you know, you're kind of done with the, the government, the media for the most part. You know, it's something like over 60% of people believe the uh we were not getting the truthful story behind the uh jfk assassination so that makes 60 percent of people you know one level of being a truther right the faith in the official story is fading fast but you know for for my purposes here what i'm talking about being a truther is and what the majority of truthers believe is that there are a group of people behind the throne people behind the throne who are controlling the politicians, the presidents, the people we see in the, you know, what I call the show, and they are keeping everybody down. Now, the belief by most of these truthers is if you remove these people who are uh, enslaving everybody, that everybody else is good and we'll figure out a system on our own and everything will be, you know, the system will stay the same. Like, you'll still have the American economy, you'll still have the you know, all the things that go with it, all the potential, all the perks, all the lifestyle. And that's just not the case, right? So the problem with that view is that the good things that we have in the system are tied to the economic disparity and the, you know, the wage slavery and all the rest of it, right? And so the people who are running the system who everyone thinks, oh, we can just get rid of them and nothing's going to change, the system would collapse along with them unless you want to fill in and take their position, right? Because the whole system is corrupt. The whole idea of extraordinary wealth where people can be multimillionaires and billionaires while other people can be homeless and without, you know, any employment or any, you know, I mean, just living in a, the depths of poverty or there's just so much levels of poverty. Like most people are poor. And then you have some people who are really, really rich. And then you have some people in the middle upper and middle class, right? But the majority of people in the world are poor, right? So 50% of people survive on $2 a day or less. And one third of the population survives on $1 a day or less. They make $365 a year, the equivalent to that. And so you understand the level of poverty. When you see the massive poverty in other countries and on a global basis, you can see the system doesn't work. It's just that we happen to be benefiting from the system because we're in lower middle class or upper middle class or even American poor for the most part is better than what other people are living in in other countries, right? So Gaddafi, who did a brilliant job in his country, and when he took over, it was the poorest country in Africa from this guy, King, king Aziz, that was a puppet king from, from Italy. And when he took over, it was the poorest country in Africa. And he was passing through all the Millennium Development Goals and he made it the 
richest country in Africa per capita income, right? Income per person, the average income per person. And he brought it up to $10,000 a year. And that's 2011 or whatever before he was, you know, they got rid of the guy or whatever it was. And so um, think about it, right? <laughs> think about that, right? So the guy took the country from the poorest country in Africa and when it was the richest country in Africa, the average income was $10,000 a year, which was a lot of money for that country. But, you know, it's nothing compared to America. You can't live on $10,000 a year in America, right? So you understand that the system doesn't work, that the system can't be a system where we have the lifestyle we have, we have the economy, we have the technology that we had, and it is a system that's based in divinity and fair play and you know, and people sharing, and I mean, that's the aboriginal tribes we had before in the small villages where there was no banksters, there was no, you know, any of these things, but you live, you know, very primitively, right? The reason we have the technology we have is because of the debt based economic system, and I've explained this before multiple times that by loaning money beforehand, you, you, um, you, you have this chance of entrepreneurship where people can innovate and create you know, companies and create technology, technological advancement and things like this because they have the, the money before they've done the work. And so being able to borrow money to do these you know, business ventures is why our economy is the way it is. But of course, it's a debt-based economic system, which is making debt as wealth, you know, a negative as wealth, which is demonic, right? It's inverted. And so it's a demonic system. But you can grow the economy really quickly and you can grow the technological advancements really quickly. And that's why we have the lifestyle that we have. We wouldn't have gotten that if we didn't have the debt-based economic system because the advancement would be relatively slow and it wouldn't be global. There wouldn't be global travel. I mean, all these things that we have now comes from the debt-based economic system. So it's, a, it's wrong to think that if we just got rid of the, the banksters and the controllers and these people that we consider evil, that our lifestyle would stay the same and that they were somehow keeping us all down because we have a part to play in it because you can become a rich person with just some initiative and effort if that's your complaint is that you're being held down well it's because you're being a victim and you're not seeing the opportunities that are there because people can become rich especially in America people have that opportunity to at least become you know a part of the middle class and it's just a matter of effort, intelligence, and things. But most people just don't have the initiative, and many people just want to be a victim, right? And so that's their part in this diabolical system, right? But what I want to get to here is something completely different. And so my point of view is quite different than the average truther, because, you know, it's this is all based in the materialism, all these ideas that the people who run the system are somehow keeping other people down and controlling them and you know which they are doing and the system itself is doing that right and that you know it's the goal here is to be free to be economically you know whatever it is equal whatever people want to think about some utopian society it's all based in material materiality in your lifestyle which comes down to the pursuit of happiness and the lack of pain right and you know most of our you know, culture is about pain killing and not having pain and, you know, having pleasure, constant stimulation and pleasure. And that's what people view success as, right? The pursuit of happiness. But that's an illusion because your soul didn't put you on this earth to be happy. When people think of a utopia, they think about everybody being happy, right? Like this is where all could be happy. We could all be living good lives. We could all live in peace. We could all live in harmony. It could all be just bliss all the time. That's not what this planet's about. And that's not why your soul incarnates. It's the pain and the suffering that makes the pleasure and the happiness better. And happiness is defined by its opposite. Everything's defined by its opposite, right? So if you want to say misery is the opposite of happiness or sadness is the opposite of happiness, all these things that, you know, are, um, you know, there's these like different distinctions, but you have to have difficulties to appreciate the good times. You have to go th through things to feel a sense of accomplishment. And that's just on the material level. But there's something bigger at play here, which is we have a soul and we have a spiritual purpose here. 
And so if you take that into consideration, then everything that happens to you, if God, like I said before, if you believe in God, you believe that there's a plan. That's the difference between being a godly person and a, a doubter, someone who doesn't believe in God, who believes in chaos, right? And so if you believe in God, there's a plan, and that everything that's happening, you know, there's an accountability system, and everything that's happening to you is happening for some sort of a reason. And so if that's the case, then your circumstance of birth, the color of your skin, your place in society, your intelligence level, your athletic ability, your sex, your, you know, your, the way that you look, whether you're, you're handsome or pretty or you're ugly or you're, you know, mediocre or whatever it is, right? Compared to, you know, what people think of you as they see you, right? The way that people look at you when they see you, you know, people look at you and see something, Right? Like, for the most part, I remember that people looked at me and were scared. <laughs> you know, I tell this story about, you know, I was I had this kind of uh, this spiritual experience where I started a uh, counseling service. And I went to these sort of New Age um, expos, you know, wellness expos and things like this. And I had this poster and image and you know, whatever it is. And I would watch people walk to the booth next to me. They would walk away from my booth like in the opposite direction then they'd walk to take a turn right or left and then walk across in front of my booth but now they were 10 15 feet away then they'd walk back towards my booth after they'd walk by it and they'd go to the next booth right so they're literally bypassing my booth and me you know and then my ex who is a much worse person but is when you know you look at her you would be less scared of her people are coming up and talking to her when i wasn't there right and so I realized, you know, I mean, these were just different times. I realized that people look at me and they're whatever they are, right? <laughs> you know, they're not um, intimidated. I don't know what it is. And I'm not, you know, I'm not aggressive. I'm not going to hurt anybody. You know, I mean, I could say some mean things, but not to strangers. You know, I mean, I, I don't, you know. But whatever it is that when they see me, that's how they react, right? And so that's a part of you, your, your perception of, who you are, and sometimes you don't even know the way people think about you. You know, I kind of thought it was funny, but, you know, it wasn't for, good for me to build a business, right? And so, um, you know, people are going to react to you a certain way, right? And just, you know, you, the energy you exude, the way that you look, or, you know, people are going to look at you and they're going to say, oh, you're this or you're that. This is how they're going to categorize you. This person is safe. This person isn't. This person's appealing. This person's you know, I'm attracted to them. Maybe not, like, I'm not even talking about being sexually attractive, but, you know, people are attracted to some people, right? They just have that kind of energy. And so all these things are part of what your subscaric package is when you come into this world, whatever you've done in the past life. You have these impressions and things. And you you create yourself as a person, as a soul, and then your life unfolds in front of you, and everything that's happening is happening for a reason. And, you know, to blame everything on the controllers and say that they're keeping me down or, you know, all these things and make it all about your material success is not, you know, appropriate because you have the opportunities that are given to you are for your spiritual well-being and benefit. But almost nobody recognizes that. And so you can throw out all these victim statements that truthers have and, you know, the deep state and this, that, the, the, the elite and these people and that people, right? Because you're given the exact opportunity that your soul has provided for you. And if we had a healthy society, the number one aspect of that society was that everybody has a purpose and a soul's plan and helping people identify what their soul's plan is and be able to, you know, make the right decisions and, and know what they're supposed to do and do it so they get maximum spiritual benefit here. That would be the ideal society. And it wouldn't be joyful, it wouldn't be utopia, but it would be productive and people would feel congruent and helping people connect with their soul, connect with the divinity within them. So they would have, you know, they'd be able to make an informed decision on what spiritually they should do in their material lives. You know, what are the, what's the right spiritual decision? What's the godly decision? And once people learned how to do that, the, it would transform the planet. And the system would unfold to be a system that supports all of that, right? The system we have now doesn't support that. And so that's much more important than any of these things of, you know, wealth and equity and, you know, fairness and all these things. And people think racism and sexism and, 
you know, all these different isms and all these different, you know, homophobia and all these things that people talk about, all these ways to feel like a victim and who's, who's the haves and who's the have nots and who has privilege and who doesn't. And, you know, you're, you're born in the circumstances that best fit you or suit you to your maximum. You know, your soul has created this, you know, this life so that you can benefit. And if you think about it that way and you, you know, you experience it in that way and you take things in that way, then the people controlling the system have no real power over you and they're not affecting you, right? And, you know, most truthers just can't even understand that. Or if they do, it's not something they can implement into their lives, but it easily can be done because there is a natural path for this kind of a system, right? There's a natural inclination on a spiritual level for everyone to find why they're here. What's your purpose here? Not on a material level, not your career, not who you're going to marry. I mean, that's all a part of it. But why are you here? What's your purpose? Why has your soul created this opportunity for you? What, what's the, you know, what, what are the circumstances of your life and the things that are going to happen, that are going to unfold, that are your spiritual obstacles and challenges that you have to overcome to make something out of your life, right? To get something out of your life and move forward on your spiritual journey. So this is a different way to look at things that I talk about here that, you know, that most truthers don't, most truthers, truthers is just about material fairness and unfairness and these things, right? Which is just, you know, it's just goofy. Like it's just a, you know, if you're conscious of the unfair aspect of the, the world and you think that there are these people, these controllers that are keeping you down and you can't do anything about it, then you lose any chance of really uh, putting any self-effort because you feel like you're screwed and that's just not the case, right? And so along with those lines, I should say this as well. Um, you know, the shadow banning thing that I talk about, I just got another comment from somebody that said, hey, YouTube actually put this in my watch list without me having to ask. You know, it's, um, it's happening a little bit better, but my view counts down now, maybe because of this Christian videos and the stuff that I did with, um, uh, you know, the, you know, the Trump stuff, who knows, or just, you know, whatever reason. I mean, it's not down like it was. It's still you know, above three, 4,000. The videos are now getting six, 7,000. They're getting 10,000, you know, so there's YouTube was recommending my stuff more, and I think they're recommending a little bit less, but again, if you leave a comment, you just leave an emoji. You don't, you, know, you can leave any kind of emoji. It doesn't matter to me. Like, I'm not offended by emojis. I can't really even see them that well, you know, <laughs> I mean, depending on, you know, and, you know, just any kind of comments, not a big deal. You like the video. Um, there's something I might read later on. There's an exchange between people because one person didn't like one or like my video because of, well, you'll uh, hear the comment. I'll probably read that at the end of the video. And so, you know, the membership program, I mean, that's a way to financially support this, the, uh, you know, the channel. People donate two bucks a month. It's you know, 100 people do that, that's $200, you know, this kind of thing, right? It's, um, you know, if I get enough people to do it, then the ads aren't such a big thing and, you know, whatever. Um, you know, subscribe, resubscribe, get notified and just all these things. Uh, share the videos on Facebook and these other places and just do anything to promote the channel and keep it going. So anyways, that's the introduction. Let's get into the other stuff here. Okay, so my wife was telling me, I don't know who she heard it from. Maybe it's... um. I'll think of the person's name later. But um, Catherine Austin Fitz was saying, you know, she has connections to the government. She's one of the more, you know, established sort of truthers. And that the Russians went to Iran and said, don't t retaliate against Israel. We'll, we'll uh, you know, do this on your behalf. Basically preventing World War III. Uh, Putin did. So, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, it's believable, right? And so this senile Parkinson's having m and is still being rolled out there, like the arrogance of these people. Because, you know, this guy should not be president, right? He quit uh, his campaign for a reason. He does, He's not fit for president. 70% of Americans, probably more than that. Because, again, there was Republicans who realized they didn't want him to step down, so they changed their opinion in polls so but there's 70 percent of americans said he's unfit to serve and there's republicans who like i said changed their 
opinion of it once they saw the debate, right? So they thought it would be better for them if he was running. Like, that's how bad it is, right? Where your opponents are keeping you in there just so they can beat you or mock you in my case, right? So he's asked by this guy, what happened? Why did you withdraw? And I can only use a little bit of this. Unfortunately, this is on CBS, and CBS sucks at copywriting because CBS sucks. But this, let's watch a little bit here. Tell me the story. Tell me the story. Tell me the story, Joe. Like, look at him. Like, does he look like he's being able to tell you a story? Well, look, um, the polls we had showed that it was neck and neck race. Would have been down on the wire. But the polls he had, right? So nobody told you that 70% of Americans said you're unfit to serve. Like, nobody told you that. Nobody in your inner circle said, hey, the American people think that you're gone and you shouldn't be president now, never mind run for president. 70%, an overwhelming majority were saying that. Again, the numbers were not accurate. It's even worse than that. Pretty much everybody who watched him knew that he was gone, right? Like, you'd have to be, like, really, really stupid to not see that. I mean, if you, if you can't see that this guy's too old. He didn't have, like, fans. He had, you know, people who don't like Trump, right? He didn't have, you know, Biden lovers. He, there was no enthusiasm behind his candidacy. It was just that people didn't want Trump, right? So if he, whatever legitimate votes he got, they were not legitimate Biden, Biden votes. They were anti-Trump votes, right? And so he was senile. And, you know, <laughs> he, he thinks that he was in a neck-and-neck -neck race. But what happened was uh, a number of my Democratic colleagues in the House and Senate thought that I was going to hurt them in the races. And I was concerned if... There was poll data that supported this, right? So, like, he's so far out of the loop, he has no idea what was going on. Like, I know more than what he does, right? Like, he still doesn't know. And maybe he's been told and he doesn't know. Maybe they didn't tell him. Both of those are disturbing. Like, if he doesn't know because they told him and he just can't comprehend it, and he's, you know, his cognitive breakdown so bad, he has no idea, right? Or they are thinking, well, we can't even talk to him about this because he's too far gone. And, like, even after he's withdrawn, they still haven't really told him. Both of those are really disturbing, right? Which means he's either so far gone that he can't remember even the, the most recent events and he has no grasp of reality and he's president. Or the people that are handling him don't have enough confidence in him to tell him the truth that he should have known, like should have heard. And so this is an insult to America that he's still president, right? Like the arrogance of these people to be rolling him st out still when 70%, and that's a huge majority, 70% is a, you don't get 70% of Americans to agree on anything, right? And 70% of Americans agree that this guy is unfit to serve, right? And he's doing interviews still. Like, <laughs> like you, they're putting it, they're shoving it right in your face. This guy is, you know, we have a senile president. They're telling you there is no president, that the presidency is a joke, that it doesn't matter who's president, because this guy can't do the job. If his perception of reality is that it was an even race, but some Democrats uh, thought he was going to pull their, you know, some of the uh, House and Senate members, like the high-ranking ones, thought he was going to pull them down, that's not at all what happened. Like, he didn't have any grasp of the problem. The problem was that he had maybe one of the most embarrassing, worst debates in the history of presidential debates, and he was clearly had cognitive issues. And before that, he went to a fundraiser where these, these big Democratic um, donors were like, holy shit, <laughs> holy shit, they were like, and George Clooney, Clooney wrote a you know, an op-ed saying this guy is, was just so far gone. We saw this guy, it, it wasn't a bad night, because we saw this guy at the fundraiser. He was clueless. He was, he was gone. He couldn't comprehend, you know, basically, like he said, we love the guy, but, you know, he can't, he can't do it. And so there was an outcry from media and, you know, the Democratic establishment, the Democratic donors pulled back their money, and there was just the, the no way this guy was going to run. 
they couldn't run him, right? And if they did get if he did get elected, he couldn't run the country. I mean, I knew, think about the circumstances that Americans would vote for this guy. Like if he did get elected, I mean, that would just be a, like a putting a target on our back, right? Saying, you know, we're incompetent mentally and we got this guy, this is the best that we can do. And so the, you know, the arrogance of this thing, right? That they're still putting this guy out there when he's this clueless. I stayed in the race. That would be the topic. You be interviewing me about why did Nancy Pelosi say, why did someone, and, uh, and I thought it'd be a real distraction. He's, he's pissed at Pelosi. He named her by name. Action, number one. Number two, because Nancy Pelosi was going to come out and say he's unfit. When I ran the first time, I thought of myself as being a transition president. Okay, so now he's talking about all this stuff, right? I'm going to skip this part, because then he's going to ask him about Bo. So here's Hunter, right? He's getting a hug from Hunter. This senile, look at this senile gone guy, and a guy who's been in and out of rehab nine, ten times, a crackhead. And a wonderful painter, by the way. He just, you know, a million dollar sales, paid millions of dollars in sales and paintings. <laughs> Jilly Jill over here. What did you say to them? It's what they said to me. What did they say to you? Uh, they said, my, my grandchildren call me Pop. My what do they call him Pop? So then he asked about his son, Bo Biden. Is he thinking of Bo, too? Look, I can honestly say that uh, I think of them all the time. Whenever I, I think of them all the time. <laughs> I can honestly say I think about my dead son all the time. You can honestly say that? Wow, that's, you know, I'm glad you said you can honestly say that because if you said that you thought about your dead son all the time, we wouldn't believe you, right? Like, what the F is he talking about? It took him forever to answer the question. He said when you were, you know, saying this thing at the end, but this is where it gets weird. I have a decision that's really hard to make. I literally asked myself, what would Bo do? <laughs> what would Bo do? <laughs> I asked myself, what would Bo do? You know, not Jesus, Bo. You know, like the same thing. He was, he should be sitting here being interviewed, not me. So Bo was the guy. Bo was the next great Biden. So he thought he could have been president, Bo, because he, they were, you know, grooming him. But they went and had brain cancer. He was a really a fine man. You know, Bo, Bo was committed to my staying committed. He was his, he was committed to his staying committed. So Bo's disappointing you, you, you quitter. Did Bo get, you know, he was like, hey, I got brain cancer and I was still out there trying to be a good Biden and you're out there quitting. Stop quitting, quitter. Bo thinks you're a quitter. Why does Bo think you're a quitter, quitter? We, uh, we had a conversation uh, toward the end when he was, we, everybody, we knew he wasn't going to live. And he said, Dad, I know. We know it's going to happen. He said, I'm going to be okay, Dad. I'm going to be okay, Dad, even though I'm going to be dead. I'm all right. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of dying. But, Dad, you got to make me a promise. I said, what's that, Bo? He said, I know when it happens, you're going to want to quit. You're not going to... Yeah, you're gonna not quit. But don't quit. Don't be a quitter, quitter. So why did you quit? Stay engaged. Even when my dad said, "Look at me, look at me, dad." Look at me, dad. These are these 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 things, these these things that were they're, whatever they're called here, these these things that you see things with. You're gonna want to quit. You're not gonna stay engaged. Even when my dad said, "Look at me, look at me, dad." Give me your word as a Biden. When I go, you'll stay engaged. Give me your word. Give me your word as a Biden? What the fuck are you talking about, bro? Give me your word as a Biden? He said those words. Give me your word as a Biden? Bidens have no word. Like, Bidens aren't... Like, people don't think of Bidens as being honest. You, Bidens make up... Uh, take other people's uh, life stories and use them when they're running for president and get busted for plagiarism and come out and, and say they've been dumb, right? And I've done some dumb things, and I'll do dumb things again. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've been dumb. And so, uh, this is, like, what a weird thing. Look at him. He's just gone. Give me your words of Biden, but then it gets even weirder. When I go, you'll stay engaged. Give me your word. 
give me your word. And I did. And then... I did. That's why I had not planned on running after he died. And then Charlottesville happened. In 2017... Well, if you gave him it was your word, right? You gave him your word. Remember these guys, these preppy guys that came out, right? They look like all work for the an FBI and their tiki torches they've got tiki torches like they're going to go to some uh, you know tropical barbecue right you know it looks like they're going to go to a luau white supremacist demonstrations in Charlottesville Virginia turned deadly when on August 12th Heather Heyer a civil rights activist was murdered in what the Justice Department called a hate inspired act of domestic terrorism Biden has long traced his decision to run in 2020 to that moment. Okay, so Snopes, it wasn't enough that 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 uh, Bo Biden came out and said, yeah, give me your word as a Biden, that you'll stay engaged and run. And Biden said, yeah, I did give him my word, but then I quit on my word and I wasn't going to run. So he just, you know, said that he broke his vow to his dead, dying son. Meanwhile, his son Hunter started banging the guy's wife, and then she freaked out because he was, you know, smoking crack, and she got involved. She was doing crack, so then Hunter came and, you know, got his his ex wife, his uh, brother's widow, hooked on crack, and you know, a bad lifestyle. She says the worst part of the worst time in her life, and then she thought Hunter was going to kill himself, so she took a handgun and threw it in the trash, a loaded handgun, and it was right across from a high school. And the Secret Service had to get involved because it was so fucked up, right? And so they found a homeless guy got it. So a homeless guy was walking around with a Biden gun, right? And so then Biden, uh, and then Hunter, you know, years, a few years later, drops his laptop into the bathtub and brings it to a computer repair shop. And the guy freaks out when he sees what's on the hard drive. He gives it to the FBI. And the government and the media choose not to tell the American people about this right before the election. And so that's all what happened, right? And <laughs> and he's like, you know, they're, they're still perpetrating this lie about Charlottesville that even Schnopes, that the goofy Schnopes, which is completely leftist and liberal, say isn't true. That he, he didn't, you know, Charlottesville had no bearing. He just used an excuse. He made it up one day, just like everything else. He makes things up. And he makes it emotional, like this big moment when I saw these horrible, hateful people. It really is the beginning of your journey to the presidency. Like, how are you even saying this, right? Who is this, like, lightweight piece of crap that he's perpetrating this thing that's been debunked over and over again? We know that Charlesville had nothing to do with him running. And we know that, you know, he wasn't a transitional pre president. See, seven years later... How do you see it? When I spoke to the mom who lost her daughter as a consequence of those neo-Nazis and white supremacists come out of the fields in America with torches. <laughs> you, you mean tiki torches? <laughs> and so he's losing his breath. He's out of breath, right? He's had some serious physical issues. You can hear he's like struggling to breathe and it's just an absolute mess. I mean, it's really embarrassing. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, I probably use more, I'm gonna have a pro copyright issues already. It's just like great that he keeps on appearing. I'd watch, I'd show you this whole thing. If uh, CBS, yeah, if it was anywhere but CBS. But the fact that they're rolling this guy out with the same old bullshit, the same old lies, when the American people have said 70% overwhelming majority and it's a lot more that this guy's too old to run and now that Kamala is you know doing whatever the Democrats have moved on from him they're rolling him out showing you that the presidency is a joke it's a freaking joke so there's an interview with Dana Bash and JD Vance very effeminate eye lining wearing JD Vance weird guy like definitely weird is a good description for him but all of them, because the other guy's weirder. Walsh, Kamala's weird, right? They're all weird. You know, like, bringing the weird word out is, you know, all these politicians are weird. Like, very seldom you see a politician that 
is authentic and genuine and represents the American people. But he says this here. Especially when we consider the fact that, as we've all learned over the last few months, Joe Biden clearly isn't capable of doing the job. And so I think that drives home. That yeah, but he is doing the job. Like, why aren't you pushing for his? And it'd be smart for you guys to make him the issue. To say, this guy has been senile. I mean, six months ago, seven now, right? It was six months when this story first broke. But it was in January, and, and that was, you know, when the the debate happened when in July. It was January then, right? I mean, back in January when a poll was taken, and 70% of Americans back then said Joe Biden was unfit to to run the country. And all the Republicans were on board with that in that poll, right? And then the poll switched with some of the Republicans only like a, uh, like 16 percent of the Republicans said Joe Biden was unfit, and the majority was independents and Democrats. So, really, it was 100 percent of the people were saying Joe Biden was unfit after the debate. But before the debate, seven months ago, the American people spoke and said, "Hey, this guy should not be president now, and he shouldn't run for president for the next you know four years." And the American people's opinion is not being regarded because they they got rid of him as a candidate but he's going to be a president until next January so and they're going to roll him out every day and show you how senile he is and that everyone's moved on from that like oh it's okay we can have a senile president we have a guy with Parkinson's who has cognitive difficulties cognitive you know breakdown his cognitive functioning is impaired his brain is deteriorating we can still have a president who you know, it's okay till, as long as he's not for the next four years. We can, you know, five months is fine. We can have him for five months, right? Like he should step down now. And the, the Republicans should be pushing for it. Like if they really cared about having a senile president. I mean, both of the Democrats should be pushing for it. It should be the right, it's the right thing to do. You don't have a guy who's senile running your country. But if it doesn't matter... If the guy isn't making any decisions, he's being completely handled, then it doesn't really matter, right? But it does matter because the rest of the world sees it, and the American people see it. It means democracy is a joke. Democracy has been killed because the American people have spoken, and they're saying, we see this guy is too old and too senile to do the job. He's got Parkinson's, right? He's got some kind of cognitive mental deterioration, and we need to get rid of him because we want to restore faith in the political system which that ship has sailed years and years ago and so like he just said it like the guy's unfit to be president and he's still president and yeah they'll say it in speeches but they're not doing anything they can in, invoke the 26th amendment or whatever it is 25th amendment and the republicans could do that in the house why not do that right and you know why not make that more of a your reason to campaign against kamala harris because she was telling everyone how great the guy was six months ago and every day since until he withdrew. And she still hasn't come out and said, oh, yeah, he's kind of gone mentally. Because the only reason she's running is the guy can't do it. He's in, mentally incompetent. Nobody wanted Kamala Harris. None of the Democrats did. And certainly the Republicans don't. But she's there and she's, you know, loving life right now because the guy that she was you know, serving under had a mental breakdown which allowed her to 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 uh get the nomination unopposed right <laughs> you know i mean she can't she can't service the american people right <laughs> she can't you know knee pads the american people like she's uh one at a time she's, she's she has no way of getting you know a job that way like you know so the only way that she knows how to get a job but then he says something even stupider especially when we consider the fact that as we've all learned over the last few months Joe Biden clearly isn't capable of doing the job and so I think that drives home that Kamala Harris really has been the one calling the shots I mean how could she not I think okay so that's just silly like how dumb do you think the American people are do you think that Kamala Harris was calling the shots because he was mentally broken down come on it's stupid do you think anybody in America thinks Kamala Harris was calling the shots like just it's silly you're a silly little man with eyeshadow, with eyeliner. There's just something I'm editing here. There's just something unnatural about his frickin' face. 
<laughs> like just look at it like when you look at his face there's just my first psalm it's like a woman wearing like a you know when they dress men up as women in some old movie you know like that um that uh movie with um Amanda Bynes did you dress up as a boy to play a soccer player like it's just something like that like his face doesn't look real it's like he's got some sort of makeup when you know the Saturday Night Live sketch where they put white face on Eddie Murphy and he got on a bus and pretended to be a white guy remember that something like that like he's his face is not right like they're using prosthetics you know when they make an actor old you know an actress old and they put on prosthetics there's just something like off about his face like there's just something like it's not you know it's not a real person like this is this is not who he is right um there's just something like look at his face more so than the, the other candidates you wouldn't say this about trump or kamala or well, the other guy <laughs> the other vice president candidate i forgot his name already <laughs> um but you know there's just something weird about him like just not you know there's there's just not normal there's like a deception here joe biden doesn't really know where he is Kamala Harris has been calling the shots. Says who? Well, I think she has to have been, right? Because if she's not calling the shots... Like this, I mean, nobody... She has to have been? No, like he has handlers, right? She's not... The vice president doesn't call the shots. Standard than who is. And I do think it drives home something that's fundamentally... Yeah, who is? The people, like, just... Like, why lie about it? Like, he has handlers, and Kamala Harris has nothing. She's... They're both puppets. The, Kamala Harris was a figurehead based on her demographics because Joe Biden promised a woman president of color, right? A African-American woman pres uh, vice president. He said that's who he's going to nominate. And he, they chose Kamala because they just love her for whatever reason, but it isn't because she's some great politician or she's some brilliant mind. And she was like secretly calling the shots. And she's not Dick Cheney. Right? <laughs> no one was saying that about Kamala, right? Like Kamala was non-existent. She was just like, oh my God, this is our sec. This is when people talked about Joe Biden being uh, mentally unfit. They're like, oh, fuck, we got Kamala, right? That was, you know, she's just silly, right? dishonest about the way that Vice President Harris and also a lot of senior Democrats have approached this. If you remember, for, for months, even years, the argument was that Joe Biden was sharp, he could clearly do the job, and the minute that he performed poorly in that debate and he became political dead weight, you have Kamala Harris and everybody else trying to throw him overboard. But I think the more troubling question is, why did so many senior Democrats, including the Vice President, cover for him? And if Joe Biden wasn't capable of doing the job, as even a lot of Democrats say now, was Kamala Harris in charge or was somebody else in charge? And that's a real, real issue. There's yeah, but you just said she was calling the shots. And so, like, it's just, you know, he has a point because this is a winning point for them. Like, you can't talk about this in a way. I mean, he kind of screwed it up, which is unimaginable, that he could screw this point up. But that's the whole point, that they covered up, right? That we all saw that he was breaking down. I saw in 2019, and he would already had I mean we all should have seen like he was just there to see and he was too old and he was like you know not functioning very well mentally and he had all the different you know they had to hide him away they couldn't even run him out in a campaign they admitted it they had to hide him away with the whole COVID thing I mean it's just nobody you know nobody thought this guy was like sharp right <laughs> and so um, they you know that was back in 2019 and for four years we've had this president doddering around and getting older and this you know and the, remember i showed you that video that guy describing all the things that he did in terms of symptoms of having parkinson's and that was very easy you know in the beginning and yeah it can look like other forms of dementia but the as it break as a person breaks down you the their gait in which biden walks and these things were all signs of dementia right I mean, besides of Parkinson, that is a differential diagnosis between Parkinson's and, and other forms of dementia, you know, senility and Alzheimer's and things like this. No evidence that Kamala Harris threw him overboard, but I just, I want to move on to uh, something that Governor Walls... Yeah, had. she just waited. Like, she knew that either he was going to get possibly elected and she would then become president because he couldn't do it, or this happened, what happened. So she just had to wait. Kamala Harris just had to wait and talk about how great he was, which was, you know, to, his own, to her own detriment. But nobody's holding her accountable for that. 
because she was like, oh, I was in meetings with him, and the guy's just so sharp, and he's so great, you know, what she said on The View six months, eight, seven months ago now. You know, the polls were out there, American people. She said, you guys are wrong, that when we see him behind closed doors, he's like, you know, he's not like this at all. It's just when he gets in front of the microphone, he's looks like he has Parkinson's. But you know, he's he's like a 20-year-old kid when he's not. He's behind, behind closed doors. He's he's vibrant and sharp, and everyone's like, oh, my God, look at this this wonderful brain, this mind this man has. Okay, so I'm editing. And what happened there, what you just saw there, and I didn't notice it. I noticed some of it, which I just commented on. But he said, you know, that Kamala Harris and the Democrats couldn't wait to chuck this guy out of there because that's part of their narrative. That's their BS narrative. You know, um, they're just trying to say they're disloyal. But she just said there's no evidence that Kamala Harris threw him under the bus. But, like, Kamala either is the stupidest person in the world, right? Like, she's, you know, she's an educated person with a law degree, and a, she passed the bar exam. I mean, she's not, like, brilliant, but she's not stupid, right? And she's certainly conniving. You know, there's a certain personality type, and Kamala and Trump both have that personality type, you know, who can strategize and be manipulative like she saw what it would do if she had an affair with Willie Brown or whatever his name is, right? The mayor, former mayor of San Francisco, the Democratic kingmaker. She knew at 29 what banging that guy would do for her career. Like she's not stupid, right? Like there's people who are conniving and, you know, whatever. And she's one of them. And so when Joe Biden asked her to be vice president, she knew that there was a path to, he, to her being president where she might not even have to get one single vote. Someone who's not likable, not electable. And, you know, if he craps out while he's in the White House, which could have easily happened. I mean, everybody knows that. Everyone knows that, you you know, first of all, you're only a heartbeat away from every vice president knows that. You're, you're, you're vice president. Your big thing is you're only a heartbeat away from being president. Like that, it's it's not a great job. And not very many vice presidents have become presidents, right? I mean, either because the guy, you know, like Gerald Ford when Nixon got impeached or Lyndon Baines Johnson when Kennedy was assassinated, you know, the assassinations or something like that. But it's still a possibility. Like, you have a lot better chance of being president than most people, right, as vice president. And so this was her big chance, and she knew the older he got, the more senile he got. She was licking her freaking lips. And anybody who pretends otherwise, right, like this Dana Bash pretending... Kamala didn't know what was up, right? Has called you and Donald Trump, and that is weird. Sure. And it is taken off. The New York Times reports that when Donald Trump was asked about it, he said, not me, they're talking about J.D. Well, certainly they've levied that charge against me more than anybody else, but I think that it drives home how they're trying to distract from their own policy failures. I mean, look, this is fundamentally schoolyard bully stuff. They can accuse me of whatever they want to accuse me of. Uh, schoolyard bully? Accuse you of being weird? Like, that's weird. Like, he's just, they're, just so, they're all so weird, right? Like, you've brought the word out, but I mean, the other guy, Vance uh, Walsh, is like, you know, I mean, that guy's weird. And Kamala is probably the weirdest of them all. And Trump's just, you know, Trump. Like, none of them are normal, right? They're not normal people because they don't run normal people, right? As Harry S. Truman once said, if you can't take the heat, stay out of the kitchen. And I'm doing this because I think that me being vice president will help improve people's lives. So I, I, I accept their attacks. But I, I think that it is a little bit of projection, Dana, if you think about, uh, you know. He's um, so effeminate. Just take a couple of days ago. Tim Waltz gives this big speech. He's been announced as the VP nominee. And I remember when I had just been announced as the VP nominee, I gave my big speech and I saw my wife and I gave her a big hug and a kiss because I love my wife and I think that's what a normal person does. Uh, Tim Waltz gave his wife a nice firm Midwestern handshake and then tried to sort of awkwardly correct for it. So I think that what it is is two people, Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz, who oh, are. Oh, I got to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is that on the internet? Because I want to see that. Okay, so here he comes. Dougie Fresh. This is great. How did I not know about this? Dougie Fresh comes in. Big hug for Dougie Fresh, right? He comes in. Dougie Fresh, big hug. 
And then look, look. This is why they need in virtual feed of fertilization. Look at Dougie Fresh. This is wonderful. Okay, yeah, there we go. And look, he's he gives her the let's not touch touch uh let's not touch crotches hog look. He's like he backs away, leans and then he leans in. Well now now her hand is here. <laughs> look at these guys. These guys haven't seen each other. She's so psyched to he just, you know, found this story that just broke that he banged his nanny and impregnated her and we don't even know what happened to the baby. Like he impregnated his nanny and like he's got a little he's got a little Hunter Biden kid running around out there possibly or she had an abortion. We don't even know what happened, right? But he banged his nanny so much that she got pregnant or at least, you know, we know once and then, you know, his wife divorced him and now that story broke and she's real psyched to see him look look at her look at you did so good honey so that was strange i mean you know like like it's one of these things when he says oh wow those guys are weird yeah you guys are all freaking weird like you, you know you guys are all non-human like it's not that they're weird they're like alien right you're not human look at the inverted side here look at this when we fight we win when we fight we win after the, they're trying to take away the fight 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 thing from Trump with his fake weird thing with a big bandage on his ear with a non-existent wound like this is how like this is your these are the best of the best at his rally in Bozeman, Montana last night, Donald Trump lost no time in disparaging Vice President Kamala Harris the only way he knows how through racist sexist insults I'll tell you right now. And she's worse than he is. She's worse. He's smarter than she is. But the Democrats didn't have the courage to force her off. They didn't have it. They didn't want to do it. It was politically incorrect. Kamala, sometimes referred to as Kamala. You know, she's got about nine different ways of pronouncing the name. I don't care if I get it right. Actually, I couldn't care less. Oh. Okay, so where was the racist, feminist, uh, sexist comments? There were, none of those were racist or sexist. This guy is the most transparent politician I've ever had to cover. That's why it's no surprise that the more fearful Trump becomes of facing Vice President Harris, the more insults he'll fling her way. But the vice president isn't taking Trump's bait. Here's how she described her campaign's approach at the rally in Arizona last night. Wait, so that was the racist, sexist comments? Like you have no regard for your audience's ability to, for critical thinking, and they're, I guess they're all you know, the average age of the person watching this is seventy years old. Jonathan Capehart, I don't know what his show is, but MSNBC's average audience age, seventy. No one's watching in Jonathan Capehart. He's you know, on, on the weekends, but like that's not racist or sexist. It's you know just Trumpy and Trump. Part of why we are going to win is because we remember and we are smart and we know what's happening this, so your way of saying that we're that we're smart is to tell american people that joe biden is sharp and the way she's talking to them like they're in kindergarten like look at how slow she's talking to him like she's talking to somebody she's used to talking to joe biden so she's this is how she talks to the American people. Part of why we are going to win is because we remember. We remember, right? Right, Joe? We remember, Joe, with your head shaking forward. Yes, Joe, we remember, right, Joe? The spoon goes in your mouth and not your ear, right? We remember, Joe. And we are smart. We're smart, Joe. Right. That's right. You put this. You put the spoon in the food, and then you put it in your mouth, not in your ear. Remember, we're smart, Joe. We're. we're maybe you remember. And we know what's happening. We know what's happening, Joe. You know what's happening. The polls and the you know election, and you know the the diaper you're wearing. We know what's happening, Joe. And we're not falling for the gaslighting, and we're not falling. We're not falling for the gaslighting, you you people. Remember when I told you guys that your president was sharp, and you guys didn't, you know, question me, even though a lot of you actually did. But now we're pretending that didn't happen, right? We're not gas. We're, we're not gaslighting you. They are, right? <laughs> for the okie doke. 
Then we're not falling for the okey doke. The okey doke. Yeah, she ain't studying him. Joining me now, Ashley. Like you, that's your like your highlights. I mean, you just saw two deplorable people. Trump being Trump, like we've we got this whole Trump game where we're used to it. You know, Trump being just you know um, insulting and you know just being the way Trump is, being degraded, not being a good person, and then Kamala Harris talking to the audience like they're kindergartners, and you don't fall for the old okey doke. I mean, just like what are we doing here? Like, are you like you just going for the 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 most asleep, most sheepish people in the country, which seems to be most, the majority of people, and pretending like what happened what's happening is happening right so there's more on trump being hacked here okay so then this happened for president donald trump's campaign says it's been hacked it's suggesting iran is involved what uh, that's right jennifer rondella but to be clear the trump campaign has so far not provided specific evidence showing that it was iran that <laughs> of course they haven't all those internal campaign documents, but they did point to a new report out from Microsoft that details a number of you know long-standing uh, efforts to interfere with the election from foreign adversaries. That okay, so um, you know, I, I don't think it's Iran, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> but that's you know where Trump's going. Criminals out of Caracas and out of all the cities, he took all of them out and dumped him into the United States. He emptied his prisons into the United States of America. Why are we taking this? Why do we take this? Why? Well, so, I don't understand why. Why do we take these prisoners? Don't take my word for it. Listen, Kamala Harris's agenda straight from her own mouth. Would anybody like to see her? Let's do it for a couple of seconds. Go ahead. Yeah, I am radical. We need to get radical about what we are doing and right. take it seriously. As President of the United States, I am prepared to get rid of the filibuster to pass a Green New Deal. There's pass no a Green New Deal. No question I'm in favor of banning fracking. Banning fracking, which, you know, you should ban fracking. That's like, I mean, for these Republican dopes, fracking's a nightmare. You shouldn't be doing it. It's freaking, it's horrible for the planet. It's just a bad thing. Um, but, you know, to these Republican dopes, ooh, we poison our ground, you know, like poison our groundwater. We have to have a buyback program, and I support a mandatory buyback program. Gun confiscation. I believe it will totally eliminate private insurance. Let's eliminate all of that. Socialist health care. But would you support changing the dietary guidelines? The, the, yes. You know, the food pyramid. What people yes. Are yes. To reduce red meat specifically. Yes, I would. Reduce meat consumption. Raise your hand if, gover if your government plan would provide coverage for undocumented immigrants. Where do you stand on? She's got her hand. She's got her hand up. She's going to give health care for illegal aliens. Stand on defund the police. This whole movement is about rightly saying we need to take a look at these budgets. Defund the police. It's asserted that ICE is perceived as the modern day Ku Klux Klan. Are you aware that there's a perception? I see no Are you aware that there's a that perception? That puts ICE in the same category as the KKK. Is that what you're asking me? I see no parallel. I'm not finished. I see none. Compared ICE to the KKK. And yeah, I am radical. We need to get radical about what we are doing. Failed, weak, dangerously liberal. Boo! Boo! And that's just a small part of it. That's just a small part. That's what we have, though. That's what. That's where they're going. We're going. Remember, I said we will not become a socialist country, and I meant it. Except, I was wrong. We didn't become a socialist. We're going beyond socialism. We're becoming, if they get in, a communist, full-blown communist. Full-blown communist. She's a full-blown. Card-carrying communist she is. I mean, listen to you dopes. Look at him. Listen when he gives you the 666 sign here. Country. This is America. We're not a communist country. We're not going to let that happen. No, we're not. We're not going to elect the, elect the communists. Woo! And Kamala is not just... She's not just dangerously extreme, and she is extreme, much more so than Biden. Because Biden didn't know he was alive, let's face it, okay? Are you 
Joe Socialist, what does that mean? What does it mean? Communist Joe, I don't know. So he Okay, so that was that. Um just went right into morning Joe here for some reason. Let's see what this is. Hello, Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. Hey. Joe, 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 Joe. Wow. Well, you might have seen a, a few people showed up in Philadelphia the other night. Oh, we saw this, right? They're talking about, like, all of a sudden rallies mean something to him. The mayor, just a little bit during his rally with Vice President Kamala Harris on Friday, we've seen thousands of supporters show up. All of a sudden, up. now you're talking about crowd size, right? Um, a lot of people are saying this is AI, whatever. Possibly. Doesn't matter. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, who wins doesn't matter. Like, this is, none of these things matter. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, there's... If whoever they pick, they pick. Like, whoever's president is the person they're picking. And they're not picking the person to make America great again or to save the country or save democracy, right? Because they can't do that. It's not on the table. So it's going to be the collapse of civilization that they're in charge of, right? The onset of that, which is what Jojo Magoo was in charge of, looting what's left of American wealth and things like this. So some weird things happen post-Olympics, and then I'm going to get into the closing ceremony, like I said, the alien connection to L.A., all these things. Um, and so uh, this is Stephen Curry's mom, and this is his crying wife, and she had a baby. The baby is sitting right there, right? She has a baby right here. And apparently a cop pushed her and hit her baby in the head. And the mom was not having it. Draymond Green came over and so they're talking in French here can you stop so even after him hitting the baby in the head, there's still nothing y'all can do to get them out of here? <laughs> so he said, even after him hitting the baby in the head, there's nothing you can do to get him out of here. Apparently Steph Curry came out kind of pissed about this. This is after he hit the epic four shots at the end of the game with France, um, you know this epic uh, basketball game, right? Um, the French are rude. It's the you know, stereotype. And, you know, I went to France once. Let me uh, turn this off and tell that story. Before that, this is Shannon Sharp and Chad Ochocinco react to Aisha Curry incident involving Paris police. There's all these people talking about this. is like a national news story in the sports world. And there's a lot of these things happening lately where... And I showed you these models that were there. We're getting manhandled by security in France. And, you know, a lot of these celebrities are being, you know, disrespected. It's always, you know, kind of interesting. I'm not against it. But, you know, you go to France and they, um, the police and the, they, they might manhandle you there. There's a couple things about this. Let me just turn this off and go to the voiceover. Okay, so before I do that, today's Tuesday, August 13th. I got to do that Tuesday sitting here. I do a Tuesday sitting every day for the griefless meditation, but um, usually I do it first thing, but anyways. So a lot of things have happened. I was going to segue right into the Olympics um, and the, the closing ceremony, which I'll show you after I get into the Trump thing with Trump and Elon Musk and Trump saying about the AI generate audience and all these things. So there's some big stuff that's going to happen. But I want to talk about France like extensively here. You know, not that I mean, every every culture has its, you know, its the type of culture it is and the type of people it produce. And there has been an update, though. So the reason the road was closed was the president of France and his dude were leaving the, the basketball game. So they closed the road, and the Curry family needed to get to their car on the other side of that road, right? And so maybe there's some privilege there, some celebrity stuff. 
but and you know a language barrier which always happens when you're in a foreign country and so they were trying to get to the other side you know you would think that the cops they would put out there would be multilingual i mean they're france and england are right next to the other the english channel and so lots of people in france speak english but they don't you know they want you to speak french it's a whole thing right there's an arrogance there but anyways in the process if them trying to be celebrities and thinking they had you know doing whatever they're doing a language barrier the cop hit uh aisha curry and the baby in the head so you know there's probably a little bit of fault on both sides of arrogance and whatever it was uh, but you know uh, there was also this thing that happened where i was listening to this guy brian winhorse talk about his time at the olympics and he said that in france and my wife agreed with this because she had spent some time there they don't have their dogs on leashes they don't believe in it and they were doing a live podcast and someone had a black lab and it ran into the equipment and almost broke all the equipment in the middle of a live podcast and the guy said you know the dude didn't say he didn't say sorry or anything like that he goes the, his co-host said well you say pardon moi and he said no he didn't say anything right he just you know like his dog knocked over their equipment and he didn't care took no responsibility and you know this is what i'm getting into here so let's get into the the stuff so years ago um i um took my second trip to india so i went there in 1995 i started doing the sajmar system of meditation in 1993 and i went there and had a you know a um kind of an epic trip i got really sick I got f- f- like food poisoning like really bad um kind of my own you know must fall <laughs> but it was you know um a whole thing i went through a whole thing it was an epic trip it seemed like i was there for like 10 years and it was like five weeks and you know i came back to america i got married got my master's degree in counseling and all these things happened and then 2005 i mean we moved from you know when i uh, came back from india i moved from connecticut to new mexico and got married then moved to idaho for a little bit and then back to massachusetts and then to virginia right so it was all over the place moving around and you know in the 10-year period and you know i had um four kids by that time right and so in 2005 right before all these things happen right all this stuff happened the whispers of the brighter world would be uh released of course the big event 2001 and then there was just all these things it was like a kind of an epic time and i went from uh virginia to the washington dc uh dulles airport and if you know anything about Washington, D.C., they have the thing called the Beltway, which you can't get. I mean, I've been there at like four in the morning, like three, like five in the morning um, and then late at night. And you still get caught in traffic, like like eight o'clock at night. There's no not getting caught in traffic. Like I, you know, I had all these. We had gone to D.C. and I like to go in there. They had, the, you know, the zoo and the museums and things, so the mall there. Um, it wasn't, you know, it was about a five hour, a three hour drive for us then, right? Um, but you, there was no, at that time, and I don't know if they've improved it. I don't know how they could because there's no available land, right? So there's a, basically a city. If you start at Washington, D.C. and you go all the way up to Boston, there's just one big giant city. Like the cities blend into each other as you go through these various states. And there's just urban sprawl from, dc all the way up to you know through new york and up through boston right up the coast and you know it's just um the traffic's abysmal and i you know i don't know how bad it is now probably worse but back then it was horrible and so no matter how early i left there was still like you might not make your flight like you never knew how long you're going to be stuck in traffic right and so this is 2005 so it's right a you know it was um September 2005 four years after the big event 2001 and the wars were raging in Afghanistan and Iraq and you know it was the airports were still very I mean there's this paranoia and this whole fear related point of course I'm going through DC which was one of the ground zeros right of the whole thing Uh, the Pentagon remember that 
And so I was like, well, this is going to be a nightmare getting through security. So I got there kind of late, um, a little bit late, right? You know, just whatever because of the traffic. I mean, I left really early, but it just couldn't calculate for that. And I was surprised at how lax the security was. Like it was just a normal airport security. It wasn't like it was, you know, as, as panicked as I thought they would be. And it was the second time that, that something like that happened because my family and I had this big old um, white cargo van. You know, it was, um, there were six kids at the time. My ex had, you know, two kids from previous, you know, situation, marriage. And we had six kids in this big van. And we went up to Washington, D.C., and we were what well, turned out to be right next to the White House. Like, I didn't understand where we were at first. And we were, you know, down one of those Pennsylvania avenues or something. And the car just breaks down, like in the middle of six lanes of traffic. And nobody's, like, helping. The car's just sitting there. Everyone's beeping, right? we got all these kids in the car. And these tourists who ended up being German end up pushing us somewhere, right? They pushing us like it took foreign people because America just sucked, right? And they got out and we pushed the car, the van over to a side street. And we were right across from the Washington Monument. So right there, like at the central place. And this is, again, only three or four years after the the big event. You know, and I have, um, you know, I'm, I mean, I don't look... Arab or anything, but I don't look white. You know, I have tan, brown skin, you know, whatever it is. Short haircut. And we had tinted windows on the van, like it was, you know, suspicious looking van, a little bit beat up, right? And it just stood there and nobody came to like, no cops. Cops were driving by us. We were trying to get help. We didn't have a cell phone, you know, so we were trying to get like, you know, some kind of service, right? And, um, <laughs> It was bizarre because this big van could have had anything in it and it sat there for like eight hours. We ended up getting some help eventually. Um, I think we went and ended up going, doing some things and coming back and the van's just parked there and illegally parked right across from the Washington Monument and nobody paid any attention to it at all. Like it was just, you know, I'm like, yeah, this thing's fake as F because they're not like concerned about this van which is a total red flag, right? A big van with tinted windows just sitting there, unoccupied in front of a, in a crowded area, in front of a national monument close to the White House, right? They're just, uh, whatever. Like, it's just business as usual. And even when we were trying to flag cops down or whatever, they just, you know, they didn't pay any attention to us. And so, um, so I already had some kind of experience where I'm like, yeah, they say it, this is some fear-based you know, whatever it is, but they're not really all that freaked out about it. And so I got on the plane and um, I got a window seat and I was sitting towards the back of the plane and a guy that weighed at least 400 pounds, maybe more, sat next to me and fell asleep. And he slept through the whole five hour flight. I had to pee like two hours into it. And it was just an uncomfortable like flight. And we get off in Paris and I'm like, all right, so I'll go I got like a two and a half hour layover in Paris. So I'm fine. We get off at the tarmac and we walk into this building and I'm like, I'll get some French pastries and have a chai or something like that, right? Um, you know, I felt good about it. Like French, French food is like, you know, well known. I hadn't ever been like in Europe and I'm like, well, you know, I'm only at the airport, but I'll have a little French experience. <laughs> and I get off the, we get into this building and it's dark and there are babies crying and there's all these like foreign people like obviously like Muslim people and you know I had no idea and and wouldn't take it would take me years to understand that all these people that were being displaced by these wars were being streamlined right to France like if you look at the map you know I have I drove I, I had a, some arrows I put on a map somewhere I'll find those images right but all these people were being um, like just funneled into France and they have like limited border security. They have, you know, they have this sort of open policy and they're being flooded by these Muslim people abandoning these countries because of the war and all these things. And I had no idea about that. But uh, again, like some years later, I, when I was doing research and all the stuff that was happening in Syria and these things, and I realized that this is, 
you know, why there's so much anti-Muslim hate in France and all the rest of these things, right? But at the time, you know, I'd just been like, well, there was no real security uptick in, in Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., which seemed strange to me. But there was this room full of crowded people and guys in full military gear with, you know, bulletproof, bull, bulletproof breasts and machine guns, and they were just yelling at these people. And it was, I don't know what languages they were being, you know, people were yelling, there's all this yelling. And I'm like, you know, I have to pee and fucking, I'm hungry and, you know, like, I'm just sitting there going, oh my God, am I going to miss my flight? Like, this is bad. And there's, I have no idea what's going on. Like, I'm completely clueless and I'm out of it. It's like the flight took off at like 10 p.m. So, you know, it was the middle of the night for me or whatever. So it was like in the morning in France or something. We got there. I don't know what it was, you know, because of the time difference. But whatever it was, like, it was bad. And it, we went through the security check right at the, the gate, you know, right when they, when they let us in. And I had no idea. Like, I'm just clueless. There's no English being spoken. There's no, like, all the signs are in French. And, like, I'm just, you know, I have no idea how am I even going to find my flight. And the people are just really rude and unfriendly. The people who are the, um, you know, we had to go through all these different you know metal detectors and things and it's crying babies and it's just like it's like some kind of you know i'm like wow this is an airport experience <laughs> you know this is like something you experience in some like riot or something right and i get through that and it's just we go through a series of hallways and then we have to go through immigration it wasn't immigration because i wasn't going into the country but it was like you know there's multiple checkpoints and by the time we get through all that, I'm like running to the airport, right? I have to run to get on the plane. Like there's no time for any of the things I wanted to do. I'm literally O.J. Simpson it through the airport to get to my plane, which had already been boarded. Like the plane is already boarded. And I get on the plane, there's nobody on it. It's a third, em it's a third full. It's two thirds empty. And I'm like, oh my God, there's, I can lay down. Like I could literally lay down across these seats and take a like, you know, get a real sleep. Because I'm going to get into India at 10 p.m. at night, which is, no matter what, when you go to India, you get in there in the middle of the night. Like, it just, all the flights just land. <laughs> you know, like, every time I've gone to India, I've gotten in there. 10, 10 p.m. is the, like, earliest, but usually it's like 2, 2 in the morning, 4 in the morning. And so, and I've been there before, and it's quite a culture shock. And so, there's all these empty seats I'm towards the front of the plane. There's rows of empty seats next to me and behind me and in front of me. And I'm sitting in the window seat again because I was like, I sit in the aisle, but I'm like, you know, there's nobody here. And this guy comes, sits right next to me, like not on the, they, like there's a seat in between us. And like, you shitting me, right? And, you know, a little time goes by and I had a picture, I have a, one of the Sajmark books there. And the guy says, oh, you're going to see Charji, the you know, master of the system. And I said, what? Like, he goes, yeah, I'm an Abiyasi. And this guy was from France, but he was living in England teaching French, and he hated France. And he just went on about how bad France was, like, <laughs> like for, like, the whole flight. It was just this, you know, kind of bizarre moment. And then when I was coming back, I flew through France, and I had, you know, a better experience in the airport in terms of more time. But I bought some pastries and, you know, whatever it was, and the pastries sucked. And the people were really rude and ended up with euros change. I mean, it was just, it was a nightmare. Really, you know, really exp expensive. I mean, more expensive, you know, it's airport food. And then on top of it, you know, the currency exchange. And like the people were just rude there uh, throughout the process, everyone there. And I'm like, yeah, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> you know, like it's, I, I just, you know, I, everything that I heard about it, everything that I experienced, of course, there was, issues over the years with the French Abiyasis, guys, people who practice the system. There was this tough looking French guy who was a gym teacher, but he's really nice. And we were traveling, we went to some, you know, spiritual gathering in rural India. And there was a bunch of, I was traveling with all these Europeans and there was all this drama. And, you know, I don't remember, like I, they put me in the front, like there was a, we were in a bus and they put me in the front. I don't think they liked me, whatever. <laughs> and I was like, you know, on my best behavior. You know, there's, I was tall, which, you know, whatever. I'm sitting next to the driver. And, but there was all this drama back there. And the people were being miserable. 
Like I went and bought the driver some sodas and kind of was apologizing for how badly these people behaved. But then we stopped at a restaurant and Chargy was eating like upstairs and all the European people and like me were eating downstairs. And I was sitting at the table with this gym teacher guy and there was this guy, he was, you know, like a couple inches taller than me and he's a real dick. And he was the guy who was in charge of Sajmark in France. Somebody I'd heard his name before. And he's just yelling at the waiters. You know, it's India, right? And there's poor service and, you know, people are hungry. But, you know, the, about, um, you know, 80 people just descended into this restaurant. It was a nice restaurant, like a, you know, nice, like a four or five star restaurant for India. And he's just being a total like whiny little baby. Like I'm just like getting irritated. You're supposed to be a spiritual person and you go through cleaning. And this guy's been doing it for 20 or 30 years. Like it is probably his sixth, seventh, eighth trip to India. You know, I mean, it's just not, um, he's just a total dick, like a baby whiner. And he, our table gets served food and he goes up to the guy who's this, you know, this gym teacher, an old guy. And he takes his plate of food and said, you know, I ordered this. This is mine. And he takes the guy's food right in front of him. And I'm like going to slap the guy. Like, you know, and I, I mean, it takes a lot for me to like want to react physically, but I just really want to slap this guy. Like, I'm like, I'm like thinking about like, how could I slap this guy and get away with it? <laughs> you know, like I think if I slap this guy, it's going to be bad. I'm in a foreign country. No one will understand. Right. And you know, <laughs> but he totally deserves it. Right. You know, when you do this spiritual practice, emotions come up because you need things need to be cleaned out. And every once in a while, somebody has a, you know, bad day, you know, bad, whatever it is. But this guy's been doing it forever. And I can tell this is just how he is. And he's a, like, and it wasn't just him, it was everybody. I'm like, oh my God, these people are horrible. You know, they're here. Like, if these are the spiritual people, like, what are the rest of them like, right? I'm talking about, like, all these European people. There was a whole, like, you know, there was drama from beginning to end. And I, you know, most of it took place with a foreign language, but I just see people yelling at each other. I mean, there was Italian people there, French, and, you know, German. I mean, there's all these different, you know, people. Some of them are obviously, you know, better than others. But the French people stood out as being, you know, a lot of just drama and these things, right? And so I get back to the ashram, and there was a French guy. You know, I went to my first trip in India. There was a French guy, and he was Chargy's, like, secretary. Like, he just was there for an extended period of time. And Chargy gave him this job, and he just pissed everybody off systematically. Like, I saw a couple of different Indian guys threaten violence. You know, this is a very passive. They're not, you know, intimidating people. Indians, I mean, they get mad and stuff, but they're not physically intimidating. And they're, and these are, like, educated people. And he just pissed people off so much. He, you know, they were threatening violence. But I had some interactions with the guy. The guy got me in to see Chargy. He was kind of cool to me. But everyone, like, hated the guy, right? And he looked like Steve Nash, the basketball player. And so I kind of remembered it was 10 years later and he had longer hair and he was trying to get into see Master Chargy in his cottage. You know, they had these gates and you had to, I mean, everyone wants to go see him and spend time with him, right? There's this whole, you know, the whole thing. And this guy was one of those people that could just go in and see him as was this, you know, this guy who was in charge of France and they're not letting him in for whatever reason. Chargy said, don't let anybody in or whatever. And he starts pushing on the gate and trying to force his way in and they're having like a, you know, like a, reverse tug of war at the gate and I'm like if you believe this shit like just these are grown people they're supposed to be like spiritual and um then this big guy the the guy who's in charge of France comes up and he starts yelling at the people calling them racist because right? <laughs> like you know they weren't letting these people in and I'm like they're not letting anybody in like we're all sitting outside and they're not letting any of us in right and I had to go see him because I had these books and things I had to present to charge yeah like a legitimate reason to see him but they just want to go and sit there and hang out and you know and so I mean all of that and then I, I go get on the plane go back to you know through Paris or whatever so I'm not a fan of the country like you know the stereotypes in terms of my experience are true like I you know and I met people that I liked who are French you know there's friends I have who are French there's some guy named Guy who's a really saintly person I mean there's you know like anything but you know the the stereotypes are there and there was always issues, right? The organization, just there was all this drama and issues and people accusing Chargy of stuff when he took over. And there was a guy who was in the like, highest region of spirituality and he was not letting this one guy in from Madagascar. 
um, which I later heard about this, you know, this whole story there. But you know, there's a French colony in Africa, and this guy showed up because he was doing the Sajmarg meditation, and they wouldn't let him meditate with him because he was black, right? And Charji and Babaji, you know, the two masters of the, you know, Charji was Babaji's disciple. They were like, they couldn't believe it, right? Like, so, you know, they, there was just a lot of bad things that happened in the French, you know, group of meditators. And these are spiritual people. Like, what are the ones that aren't, you know? Like, so, um, so yeah, I'm not a big fan, <laughs> you know, based in my experience, right? Which brings us to these weird, um, you know, these alien things that were going on. Okay, so I was going to segue into the Olympics and the closing ceremony and the ties to Los Angeles and the the um, alien stuff and the alien invasion. But let's cover the breaking news with the Trump stuff here. And then I'll get into that after the, the Trump stuff. Okay, and I should have mentioned, you know, the racial implications of the cops smacking Aisha Curry in the face and the baby, right? You know, so whatever's going on there. The issue in, in Europe is the birth rate, right? The birth rate of Europeans is abysmal. And they have Muslim people come in who have a high birth rate. And they're coming in in droves because they're being pushed out of their countries because of the, you know, the wars that have been created there. And so the, France is under crisis with all that and the tension there now and the you know, hostility and the whatever, the racial tension, division, all this stuff, right? It's like, you know, the the hellscape that Trump imagines the southern border here in America is with the immigration issue. It's like what, you know, it's a much smaller country with a, a higher rate of immigrants coming in and they're freaking out. But let's get to this other thing here. Okay, um, there's been some major developments, not this video, but this video is interesting. With the Trump-Elon Musk interview, I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, I already got most of the Olympic stuff done. I have to edit it. Uh, today is um, uh, Tuesday, August 13th. And so last night a bunch of stuff happened. <laughs> and so I'm... Uh, you know, I'm um, going to put some of that stuff in before I get to the Olympics here. Some big stuff with Trump. But first, let's start here. Hey buddy, Tim Walls here. Well, not a normal week, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, started out missing a call from the vice president, pretty important one, uh, and then got that call and, and honored to join the ticket with Kamala And then there was a call that you showed everybody, which was staged, right? And to take uh, us in a great direction. Uh, after that, it has been a whirlwind. We got on a plane and we flew to Philly and they told me that in an hour I'd be giving a speech and there'd be a teleprompter, something I had never used in my life. So, uh... All right, so um, they gave you uh, a speech, right? So he just admitted they had written a speech for him. He had zero input into the speech, right? Like that's as big of a mission that you'll ever hear that he was told he was going to be vice president. He was flown to Philadelphia, and they had already probably had a, a speech for Josh Shapiro, who was going to be their original pick, but then he became too controversial. His home state, he was going to be giving a speech, and Tim Wallace was going to get up, and they were going to have a speech ready for him, and he was going to read it off a teleprompter. Like he's, you know, he's vice president, and now he's given his opinions, like his what he believes. His beliefs have just been given to him by a bunch of handlers, right? Like, did you say, well, what do, what, do I have any input into the speech? No, you don't. Just get up there and read off the telepopper m and i well, I'm certainly terrified, um, but was lifted up by the folks in Philly. My goodness, there is You so were much terrified. So, like, this moment's terrifying to you. Terrifying energy there is so much positivity and then to watch vice president harris just deliver this this joyous message this one that, that was written for her the same way because neither one of us has any input into our opinions and beliefs everybody's included that the democracy is strong when everybody gets to participate took exactly when they when you're told what to say that to uh, western wisconsin you didn't even get to participate in your own speech motherfucker <laughs> like <laughs> you didn't even get to participate in your own Opinions. This is your rollout as a national candidate, and they're telling you who you are and what to say and what you believe. 
Build that felt a little closer to home with a whole bunch of folks. A joy there. Went to Detroit, uh, talked about Motown a bit, and then uh, and then saw fifteen thousand folks. Fifteen thousand folks. There's all these folks everywhere. Folks everywhere. They want to take this country in a direction that everybody does matter. Um, in a new direction, because right now the Democrats control the presidency. Out here in uh, in Phoenix and Las Vegas, same thing. Record crowds of people uh, gathering, and, and they're joining us for one simple reason. They, they love the democracy, and they love this country, and as Vice President Harris says, they believe in the promise of America. So we're just getting this thing started. We're just getting it started. Is off and running, so uh, follow along, get involved, uh, make an effort to talk to somebody about a positive vision of this country that we all know is there, and uh, we'll see you out on the trail. On the trail, this guy. Um... So, this is Tim Walsh, and I guess they approved this message, right, Tim? They allowed you to, to say these things as long as they approved everything you say. Are you reading off a teleprompter now? Did you make up any of these words yourself, or did you read them all? Because, you know, that's the life you're living now, bro. So, I wouldn't have included anything else in the video. You're going to see a few more things I got from yesterday, and then the big stuff on the Olympics, and the alien invasion and all the things, right? Um, the link to France and, and the rest of it. And so um, to start off with, though, this came out last night. So I have to put this in somewhere before the, the Olympics stuff. And, um, you know, this is, well, let's just get into it here. Donald Trump is off the campaign trail, but he's all over the map as he tries a variety of new attack lines and tactics against Kamala Harris. The Republican nominee seeming to grow more rattled by his Democratic opponent's momentum right now as she heads into her party's convention one week from today in Chicago. CNN's Elena Treen is covering the Trump campaign for us. Elena, is Trump struggling right now to sharpen his message against Kamala Harris? I would say the answer is going to be yes, Wolf. <laughs> as well as his allies that they are still trying to figure out which lines of attack work best against Harris. And yes, I think you it's fair to Okay, so that's just silly because there are all these lines of attack to use against Harris. First of all, she has to answer for the senility of Joe Biden and going along with that, but they're not pushing that enough, right? Uh, the Trump campaign, certainly the media, I don't know what they're doing on Fox and these other media outlets doesn't matter the media doesn't matter because nobody watches it right the average age is over 70 so that tells you everything you need to know about the mainstream media but in terms of what Trump's doing his campaign she has to answer for everything that Joe Biden did in his administration she saddled with the bad economy and the immigration issues and then her hyper liberalism and all of her old weird stuff that she put out there her laugh and all these things She's, un, she's very unlikable. And so you just got to get people to see Kamala. You got to give them a, bit, a big dose of Kamala and make sure that they see Kamala over and over again because she's repulsive, like she repels you. And so it's not hard at all. Like writing against Kamala would be easy if you didn't have Trump as your candidate who had, you know, Trump was capped off where 52% of Americans said they would never vote for him. So they're looking for any alternative to Trump, right? I mean, that's most Americans going into this election are never Trumpers. And so that's the issue they have. It's not that Kamala is great or Kamala is, you know, can win people over. Or Kamala is, they're voting for Kamala. They're voting against Trump, right? 52% of the people potentially will vote against Trump. What you're trying to do is get them to just be depressed and not vote at all. Like, you want to suppress the vote. So that 52% doesn't matter because 48% of the, the vote is enough, right? Fair to say that they are struggling with exactly how to define her. Now, I do want to point your attention to what we saw over the weekend because I think... They're struggling how to define her? ...shows that any hopes that his allies and his advisors had that he would focus on policy and going after Harris's record uh, were dashed when he shared and pushed this false conspiracy theory... Clay's false conspiracy theory. Claiming that the crowd at one of her rallies in Detroit uh, was manipulated by artificial intelligence. I okay, so that's false because they have been pushing the policy. They've been pushing this idea of liberal Kamala, all these things, right? Um, 
but the stuff that CNN's going to show you is stuff like this because Trump keeps on shooting himself in the foot because the guy gets obsessed, right? The guy is obsessive. We know that he gets triggered, and he's triggered right now. He's triggered because Kamala's crowd size. You know, he's been talking about constantly, and it's 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 killing him in his campaign because they're they're using it here. The reason you're hearing on CNN is because it doesn't help Trump at all talking about crowd size, right? I also think that, you know, perhaps even more ominously, he had pushed uh, this idea that only Democrats can win elections by cheating. And, of course, we know that uh, it's reminiscent of what he had said back in the aftermath. Has anyone noticed that Kamala cheated at the airport? There was nobody at the plane, and she AI'd it and showed a massive crowd of so-called followers, but they don't exist. And so this is what he's upset about that she is like again there's a guy who pretended to get shot in the ear which we now know is completely fake i mean everyone should know that like it's just it was fake when it first happened and i called it fake and it's been fake ever since right and like it's just disappeared like it's a you know because it's fake trump keeps on talking about it, but now he's more obsessed with this now his number one thing is the crowd size and i'm going to show you why that is I know exactly why this is. I didn't know two months ago, but Trump revealed something after the shooting. She was turned in by maintenance worker at the airport when he noticed the fake crowd picture, but there was nobody there. Later confirmed by the reflection of the mirror, like finished on the vice presidential plane, she's a cheater. She had nobody waiting at the crowd, looked at like 10,000 people. Same thing is happening with her fake crowds at the speeches. This is the way the Democrats win elections by cheating, and they've even worse at the ballot box. You should be disqualified because of the creation of fake image of election interference. Uh, fake image is election interference. Anyone who does that that will cheat at anything. Well, a guy who pretends he gets shot in the ear, like that's not cheating. It's not not worse than faking a crowd. So, like Trumpers have nothing to complain about, but they always complain because they're Trumpers. But you know, this is um, this is his obsession right now. Math of 2020. But I'm going to read for you what he wrote. He wrote, "Quote: uh, She AI'd it and showed a massive crowd of so-called so-called followers, but they didn't exist. This is the way the Democrats win elections by cheating, and they're even worse at the ballot box." Now, let's just be very clear. Of course, Democrats do not only win. Okay, so that's not true because there's more potential Democratic vote out there. They have a bigger tent than the Republicans. Republicans vote. Democrats may or may not vote. And they, they don't have the kind of support and the passion that the Republicans have, especially for Trump now, right? But the issue here is why Trump is obsessed with this, because it's not something that wins for him. You know, there are certain issues that, when you talk about them, they're good for you. And there's issues that are bad for you. And Trump constantly talk about being screwed and being victimized. Remember here... He had this bandage on. We realized, we later found out no stitches, nothing there. Like, they didn't even cut him, like, you know, like, uh, a.k.i. Rocky, like, uh, a la Rocky in the Rocky movie. You know, that they didn't even bother to make it, like, where he was actually had a wound here. He took off the bandage. I mean, this is a small area up here that his doctor, who I'm sure exaggerated, said was uh, less than two centimeters. So less than an inch, but not even. No real blood. We saw the fake ketchup. I mean, this thing's so fake. And they showed up with this bandage. And he reveals to you what his motivation is here. I realized, because I looked, everybody was stunned. You know, we had thousands and thousands of people. Uh, a good group in the back, but they were great. You know, it was just like a backdrop. And nobody stampeded, nobody ran. You know, usually when they hear a shot, if you go to any, we have people that do this for a living, it's called crowds. It's called crowds. And they said when a bullet goes off, everybody starts running for the exits. Nobody ran, including the thousands, I mean, tens of thousands of people were in front. Mm -hmm. And nobody why, why, did, why, why was it, Donald? He ran, and nobody ran in back. The back was like a sample of it. And you had one man, and the man dressed in black. I mean, they were all becoming famous people with a black hat. This guy, and he's, this guy. he's looking like, is he standing up? Where are they? 
And he starts pointing. This man had no fear, and none of them did. And the women were incredible. Some went down, you know, for a little cover, but nobody ran. And everyone that went down came up. Yeah. And they thought I was in trouble. They And they were right, but they thought I was in trouble because they saw... So this is their reason. They put themselves in harm's way because of their love for Trump. Ready? Saw the blood immediately because it was over here. And, sir, these, the, the media always slanders these crowds as you know, MAGA extremists, and of course they slander the president too, and it really is, I think, a testament to the movement, how calmly people responded to it. That's definitely the thing yeah. I took away most from it. Yeah, that oh, was amazing. But it was love too, it, was, it just... Absolutely. They didn't... It was love. That these people really take a bullet because they love Donald Trump so much. And this is, he's, he talked about this constantly in his speeches. This was his big takeaway from the event. How much they loved him. Well, they loved me so much. They loved me so much. They just loved me. They were willing to sit there in harm's way. Some of these guys didn't even get down when bullets were flying because they loved me. And they were willing to get shot just because of their love. They didn't, they didn't care about themselves. This is like a cult leader, right? This Jim Jones stuff. That these people, they love for me, that they were willing to stand there and, you know, with hail of bullets and, and just, you know, be concerned about me and, and forget about themselves because I'm so, you know, I'm a divine like being and they're worshiping me, right? This is his motivation. Like he was obsessed with this. This is why Trump is so obsessed with crowd sizes, right? This is why Trump is, um, you know, this is Trump being Trump, right? Because it's very hard to, when somebody's a pathological liar, and everybody's lying it's just you know people lie because they don't want to face who they are so they start believing their own lies and when once that happens you're really fucked like once you really buy into your own bullshit you're really screwed over your life is toast because you start making things up about yourself and then believing it and so like it's bad enough to lie to other people but it's much worse to lie to yourself because then you just go down this slippery slope of mental illness and you create your own false reality and you know this all the time you deal with people all the time you can see they're lying to themselves and when you tell them the truth about themselves like when you see the truth that they don't see I mean this is you know I worked as a counselor certainly as a, a preceptor in the Sajmark system of reading people and sometimes I do it in the comment section right I you know, answer, I say comments, I point out things that people don't want to know about themselves. I mean, have you ever had that in your life where you've told somebody something that's so obviously true to you and probably to lots of other people, maybe everybody, and that person is oblivious to it and they freak the frick out, right? And so, um, like, that happens all the time. You know, that people are oblivious to how they really are. And they do things that are bad and evil and they rearrange it like they're the victim and they're the hero, right? And so it's very hard to figure out someone's true motivation because there's a sea of lies and deception. But Trump's motivation now as a person, like is a Trump as a as a um, as a reality TV star and a, a kind of successful businessman who was going bankrupt all the time was about Trump love. <laughs> what do we know about Trump in, in terms of he loves the people that love him like how, how do you manipulate Trump you butter him up when you give him praise all the foreign leaders all the people have learned to praise Trump right and you know also that you're willing to throw yourself under the bus for him and so that's the two things or the Trump will throw you under the bus anytime but you're supposed to give him unconditional love if you give trump the slightest bit of criticism he goes off and turns on you gets triggered and he goes on these tirades anybody who calls into question trump's greatness is immediately you know a target of his ire right his wrath and so that's the first part but what he really loves is people loving him and people adoring him and treating him like some cult-like figure and the fact that these people you know in this fake stage event wouldn't run and they'd be there just concerned about trump and they saw the blood and they just loved him so much and they couldn't you know and he talked about it. i mean he was obsessed with this thing 
It's what he talks about most in all of his speeches, how great his audience was, and how the size of his audience and how much their adoration they had for him. Even though it's all fake, he's lying to them. He's not really, uh, he's not a, he's not a, uh, a trumper. The beliefs that he's putting out there are not his beliefs. He's pandering to his audience and they're lapping it up. And there is a lot of enthusiasm and he has a lot of you know energy. And his big claim to fame is that he has the biggest audience and he has the best supporters. And his supporters, they can do no wrong. And he can lie to them and cheat on and change his opinion and say that he protected Hillary and all the things that I covered in my last video. He can do everything to them, right? Abuse them in every possible way, change the rules, change the goalposts, do all the things that he does, and they'll still follow him. And there's, he can do no wrong. He can shoot somebody in the face in Fifth Avenue. And that's what he loves about it. He loves that they love him, right? And so the idea that Kamala would be able to generate enthusiasm and crowds, because Joe Biden couldn't do it. They hid Joe Biden away. And Kamala sucks as a speaker and, you know, all these things. But this is what Trump's obsessed about, right? You know, a few people sent me this AI stuff. And I'm like, you know, who cares? Like, Trump faked a, you know, faked a, uh, you know, a shot to the ear. And the AI stuff is not going to be covered by the mainstream media because they would already know, right? They would already know that the crowd sizes are, like, they would know if a green screen was being used, the mainstream media, because they're there at the events. They have people at the events themselves, right? And unless you go to a Kamala event yourself and see a big crowd, you don't know. Like, you know, you'd see the enthusiasm, right? I know in the beginning she had rap artists and, and uh, you know, famous people coming to her events to draw in the crowds but now maybe they have their own crowd who knows i don't know you know kamala herself isn't an inspirational figure and she isn't charismatic like trump but she might have big crowds now and even if she doesn't you know trump is always i mean he just faked two things he faked the the shot of the year and he faked the oh somebody did a doctor thing and i showed you just these things trump's a liar and a flim flam man and he's lying to his people and he's just better at it and he's he's be able to and trump will go full you know he'll say things that he'll go full crazy you know in terms of right wing crazy qb crazy and say things that trigger the mainstream media right like for example calling out the ai when he himself is faking a shooting which you know they're they must be aware at least some people the media that the shooting's fake and kamala is fake you know the whole thing's fake right but they're not supposed to call out the other person for stuff they're doing themselves, right? And this is why Trump gets himself in trouble. And so there's a comment here that somebody left. This is a classic uh, Trump comment, right? And the person here, i got to make it a little bit bigger. This is to my kaboom. Trump admits he protected Hillary and he does the doctor, you know, whatever it is. You are right about the system, but wrong about Trump. And the person writing capital letters. He tried to work with the Democrats and both sides showed him who they really are and now he wants them gone. Trump did not try at all. Trump came in guns blazing. He criticized everybody. Remember the Chuck Schumer thing and I'm not going to show you the I have that meme where Chuck Schumer says well let me just I'll stop here and I'll, I'll put the Chuck Schumer meme in. You take on the intelligence community they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Back at you. Back at you. Back at you. So what happened was Trump came in and he criticized the intelligence community. And they immediately went after him. And eventually he had to cave and he had to stop doing that. Like when he realized how, you know, how how brutal they were. And a lot of this stuff came from him pissing off the intelligence community. He systematically pissed everybody off by going after them when he himself sucks, right? And that's part of the reason the media hates him and everyone hates him. You know, like you say, all right, Trump derangement syndrome. Well, it isn't because Trump is the good guy and he's the hero and they're attacking him. That he's the savior, he's the Jesus, and he's being persecuted for for saving America and making America great again. That's not, you know, it's just not there, right? And so these dopey Trumpers buy into this ridiculous, you know, they should see, they can't see him for who he is. He tried to work with the Democrats and both sides showed him who they really are and now he wants them gone. I watched it all unfold, and I know exactly what's going on. Yeah, you're, like, um, really stupid. Like, 
you don't you you watch the most like on the most remedial level with no critical thinking skills and the issue here is for all these trumpers is what would you do if trump was fake what would happen if you couldn't believe in trump anymore what would you know what would that do to you as a person it would devastate you like all these trumpers have tied you know the hope and future of america to this guy and you know even after he got exposed with the operation warp speed and on covid and uh, all these things that happened in the election and he just completely folded and was worked and i mean just showed you who he was and all their bullshit things of you know like like how can you have i mean remember when the cubies were talking about thousands of sealed indictments and all and like then trump comes out and says that he could have put hillary in jail but didn't he chose not to because she's a part of the club and his the people still don't get it and i showed you this i showed this dope this stuff in the video i showed him you know saying this thing about doctor right and he says the person says the system is a unit party they're all buddies both sides hate trump with the exception of a few people on the right they could kill him or put him in jail anytime they want Okay, so there are people on a lower level that hate Trump in the media and politicians. But people running the show, the people I call the controllers, they love Trump. Why do they love him? Why is Trump... He's been the center of the political universe now for eight years. They usually get called sexual deviants or female dingbats. Their people are for real. But they don't pull any weight ever. The leadership of the GOP play the other side but still make certain... The establishment gets their way because they are the establishment. But if you think Trump isn't going to go in and clean house, you don't understand how they changed him. I do. <laughs> yeah, like you, you understand the most remedial, like you're, you're, you're watching a puppet and you believe in it. And this is what Trump wants. He wants really dopey people like this that are just so desperate. And that's the thing about Trumpers. They're like the most desperate people, right? They're the most desperate of all people. And the Democrats are desperate in their, their way, but their, you know, their movement is being pushed forward. The Republicans are you know, people who are losing their power, white people who are losing their, you know, their hold over America, losing their lifestyle, losing their money, losing their you know, the culture, losing everything that they grew up with. You know, older people are people who have you accustomed to these type of, you know, America being a certain way, right? They're taking your privileges, right? They said it. You, you, have, you, you shouldn't have privileges. We're taking them away. They're not rights. They're privileges. And now we're taking them away from you. And they think somebody can save that, and they can't. In fact, Trump is helping them take this stuff away from you. And you don't even see it, right? And so, like, this was it. Like, this is why he cares about Kamala's, you know, crowd size, because he wants dopey people like this, doe-eyed people, who just lap up what he says and, you know, lap of his all this fake shit that he does but he wants to call bs on the other side when it's all fake because neither one of these people have any power and they're all deplorable like they're the word they're not even good actors the characters that they've created here aren't even good characters and with the internet and the, the exposure of every little detail and you know people getting to access you know it's not you only get the the information that they filter through the mainstream media that doesn't exist anymore when I grew up, it was like a, the mainstream media was a filter, and you only got to see what they showed you. And now with the internet, you get to see all of it. But people can't comprehend what they're seeing. Like, that's the sad part. Like, you get all of it, but it's too much for people. Like, now you're just, you got to pick out the, the needle of, of truth in the, in the hay bale of, uh, the hay bale of you know, falsities and lies and disinformation. And so this is Trump. Um, Let's get to this other thing with Elon Musk here. Okay, so Donald Trump, J. Trump, Donald J. Trump returned to Twitter. Our economy is shattered. Our border has been erased. We're a nation in decline. Make the American dream affordable again. Make America safe again. Make America great again. So um, that was, well, I guess there was an earlier one here. So this was his last tweet here from 2021. Then this was from 2023 with his mugshot. And then um, he posted this video and this tweet, right? 
And then, you know, it showed Elon Musk and him coming to all these things. Just look at him going there, Elon Musk, looking Elon, Trump looking pointing, and covering his ear where there's no wound. And then um, they got a little Kamala ad here. Hi. East San Francisco radical Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, my pronouns are she and her. You're considered the most liberal United States senator. I Well, actually, the nonpartisan GovTrack has rated you as the most liberal senator. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> He's a freaking goober, right? Senator. Do you have any plans? to visit the border. We are going to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. I am in favor. <laughs> Do we have, is there an immigration problem in Europe? ...of saying that we're not going to treat people who are undocumented and cross borders criminals. That's correct. That is correct. A lot of the signs at the rally you just held were people standing there saying, abolish ICE. Yeah. Is that a position that you agree with? We need to probably think about starting from scratch. So you support giving universal health care, Medicare for all, to people who are in this country illegally? I am opposed to any policy that would deny... Okay, so you get the idea here. Here we go. As we go up the top here, he's walking down the stairs. Trump and Vance. So he posted a lot of things. Then there was this that happened. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, Hello, Elon. My apologies for the late start. Uh, we unfortunately had a massive uh, distributed denial of service attack against uh, our servers. And so they were hacked. Here it is here. Well, Trump is back on Twitter. The former president posting this quote, are you better off now than you were? Make the American. We saw that here. The Miss Mugshot. So why post on X now? Well, maybe it has something to do with his big conversation with Elon Musk tonight, which was supposed to start at the top of this hour. But there were major tech issues with users reporting that they could not get into the X Spaces page. Okay, so eventually they got it figured out. But with AI now, they can just hack anything. There's so many hacks going on. Trump's been hacked now. Twitter's been hacked. The software for car dealership was hacked at the same time, right after they they had hacked... Um, the uh, AT&T, and then just all these things. Because AI makes it very easy for them to break the encryption codes, is my understanding. So it's a lot easier for hacking to go on, which is the end of everything. Because everything is dependent on these sites, and hackers are able to now infiltrate into critical... I mean, we had that thing that happened a couple of years ago with the uh, oil refineries. And so hacking is going to be a weapon of war and I don't think America is up for it right it's a war that America hasn't prepared for and then there's just not just governments but there's hacking you know there's groups of hackers out there foreign hackers that are able to extort money so that happened so I'll show you a little bit of the interview I haven't watched any of it yet but it's for next time I'll show you some here and I'll cover more of it later but this is from Elon Musk you watch the Hunger Games and side with the Resistance. You watch Star Wars and side with the Resistance. You watch the Matrix, side with the Resistance. Divergent, V for Vendetta. When it's fiction, you understand, yet you refuse to see it when it's the real reality you're living in. Wild. Well, no, because Trump isn't the Resistance, and you're not the Resistance. You were the richest man in the world for a while. How are you the Resistance? Both of you are, you know, assets, right? And so to call you guys the resistance, and I talk about this all the time, I've said this myself, but these guys aren't the resistance, right? We're the, you know, there is no resistance because we're all trying to save the same empire. We're all a part of the evil empire. See, that's the issue that nobody understands. The empire is evil, and it's evil by every definable measure. The biggest part of it being evil, it disconnects you from the divinity within you and turns you into a much worse person. And then all the other things that the empire engages in, murder and abuse and, you know, the destruction of the planet and, you know, all just ungodly, un, un, uh, divine things, right? Ego, tisto, you know, promoting the ego, the egoism and just all of it. This is an evil empire and we all want to save it. Like everyone, to some extent, wants the empire to keep on going because of our lifestyle. And so there's no resistance because there's nobody out there 
that really wants to collapse the system. If this was a resistance, you take the system down completely. But we don't have to even do that because it's destroying itself, right? And so this whole thing is silly. You're not the resistance. You're just, you know, a couple of dudes, a couple of douches up there pretending like you care about people, right? Uh, we unfortunately had a massive uh, distributed denial of service attack against uh, our servers and uh, <laughs> saturated all of our... All of our uh, data lines like basically hundreds of gigabits of so they reduced twitter and elon musk to radio like elon musk you know the tesla company is more of a computer company than it is a car company right it's more of a software company right the extensive software it takes to run these electronic vehicles and elon musk has been you know one of the uh the innovators of this industry and everything that elon musk has done is tied to some sort of technological breakthrough or whatever right and he couldn't prevent the hacking of the most important interview he's going to do and that they got you know they you have to you have to listen to it it's on radio of data was saturated um we've uh, we think we've overcome most of that and uh so it, it's uh, not time to proceed but um as as this uh this massive attack illustrates uh there's a lot of opposition to people just hearing um, what uh, President Trump has to say, and um, yeah, that you you have no evidence to support that. We don't know what this is going on, right? But where's the where's the video, Elon? Where's the freaking video, bro? So, but I, I'm honored to have this conversation. I want to emphasize it's a it's a conversation, um, and it's really intended to just get get a feel for what Donald Trump is just like in a conversation. Um, it's, it's hard to catch a vibe about someone if you. Just don't hear them talk in a normal way, and when I guess his vibe, you know, when there's when there's an adversarial interview, like n no one's themselves in an adversarial interview. Um, so for and, and this is really aimed at uh, kind of open-minded, independent voters who um, you know just trying to make up their mind, uh, and uh, so you can understand like what what is. Uh, you know, what is it just like to have a conversation? So, um, uh, hey, Elon, good to it, bro. Honored to, it's, it, it, Donald, great, great to, uh, to speak. Um, we, we had a, a great conversation yesterday, as, as you mentioned yesterday. If, if we could just record that conversation and post it, it would have been excellent. <laughs> and I, I hope we can have something like that today. Well, I think we will. I'm pretty sure we will. And congratulations, because I see you broke every record in the book with uh, so many millions of people and it's an honor we view that as an honor and then uh, you do want silencing of certain voices usually those are voices that have something to say that are constructive oftentimes <laughs> constructive and, yeah you know like trump is the the most positive guy out there <laughs> so we have to consider it an honor but congratulations on breaking every record in the book tonight you broke all the records tonight by this interview you're this list is record breaking. So it got 400,000 views. I can refresh this, but I'm not going to. Um, as of this morning. And on Twitter, it has um, 177 million views. This is the one on the Trump's thing. I don't know if there's another one on Elon Musk's uh, page here. He's saying here combined views of conversation with. The real Donald Trump and subsequent discussion on other accounts is now at one billion, and so that can't be accurate, right? Because that's one sixth of the people in the world decide to tune into this. That's just not one seventh. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? There's only three hundred million Americans, and I know half of them didn't listen to this thing. I mean, wouldn't even listen to it, right? And so that's um. You know, <laughs> there's no, you know, there's no billion. Like that's, you talk about inflating an audience. There's no way the, a billion people listen to this, right? A billion people? Like if you understand the majority of people don't have the comprehension to, to even conceive of something like this. If you go out into the world and you see the way people are living in poverty, malnourished, you know, when I was in India, right? When you go to these countries where there's this, you know, this, I mean, soul-crushing poverty. Again, you know, ego-crushing poverty is maybe a better way to put it. 
but these people have they don't even have the the ability to to comprehend what's being said i mean you know there's this is um an estimated 1.46 billion people speak english around the world that's 18 percent of the global population right almost 20 percent which is you know quite astounding that means that of all those people two-thirds of them listen to the trump interview with elon musk it's silly it's not a billion people or can you say that people have repetitive views like they came back to the interview all right sure that's a, maybe a possibility but you know it's silly like it's silly come on that's great well thank you um well I mean, maybe uh we, we could start off with um i mean the assassination attempt uh which uh w- w- was an incredible thing and i have to say it's that, an incredible thing the assassination attempt was so incredible that's uh you know your actions after that mess that, that assassination attempt were inspiring um you know after you, that what did he say maybe uh we, we could start off with um i mean the assassination attempt uh which uh w- w- was an incredible thing and i have to say that uh you know your actions after that nest that that assess- the nest the nest that 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 assess assassination attempt were inspiring um whatever that was weird um you know you instead of shying away from things instead of ducking down um you were pumping your fist in there and saying fight 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 and i think that's i mean okay so that's the stupidest ass shit i've ever heard <laughs> so this is trump from wwe and this is trump from pumping his fist in the air and saying fight 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 okay so Trump gets down, right? There's shooting. He touches his ear. He gets on the ground. He's on all fours. And then they pile on six guys, six big, strong guys pile on Trump. They, um, you know, Trump made a big deal about this. And so he gets up, and then he's pumping his fist in the air and saying, fight, 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 exposing his head. And Elon Musk says that's a good thing. It's not a good thing, right? If If there are bullets flying in the air, there's no reason for your head to be in the air you know my brother said when they were in vietnam they'd be in the foxholes and they just put their gun above the foxhole and shoot in the direction of the Viet Cong. but you know they weren't putting their heads above the foxhole because you get you know that's why they started to do these tunnels and you know digging out trenches and things in world war one because you were below any chance of bullet fire of course then there was mustard gas and you know artillery and things but when bullets are flying, you get down low and you stay there because it's just a smart thing to do. Like, you're not, you know, defying. I mean, it's not uh, courageous to go and stick your head up when bullets are flying by you. It's stupid. And he's, you know, a guy who's supposed to be so important to the movement, there should be some self-preservation there. And so for Elon Musk to say that this was awesome, let's listen to that again. I missed it the first time. I'm editing now. But, you know, it's silly. Like, this is just silly. It's one of the stupidest things he's ever said, Elon Musk. And he said a bunch of stupid shit, right? Like, you keep your head down because it's just what you're supposed to do. And the Secret Service have a job, and you're putting their lives in danger. And you're, you know, by delaying the process and pausing there and, and saying fight, fight, fight. You know, that was just performative, right? And Trump is a self-preservation guy. He would never stick his head in the air if there were bullets flying around. If there's a legitimate chance of him getting shot. He told Trump does not want to die. He doesn't want to die for you or these this movement. He, he knew this you know, this was fake. He knew it was fake. That's why the Secret Service allowed him to do that, because they they can't even be real Secret Service. I don't even know who these guys were, right? The whole thing was WWE the whole way. And Elon Musk buying into this thing. You know, you instead of shying away from things, instead of ducking down, um, you were pumping your fist in there and saying fight, fight, fight. And I think that's I mean, you know, the, the the president of the United States represents America, and I think that is... Oh, my God. Like, it was so fake. It was so freaking fake. This guy's supposed to be smart. I mean, he's obviously a liar, CIA operative, um, shill or whatever. But come on. Like, it was so fake. So freaking fake. That is America. That is, that is strength under fire. And um, so that's, uh, you know... A, a big, uh, you know, part of the reason why I was uh, excited to endorse you as uh, the, the 
the president of the United States. Oh, we're going to revisit this. I'm just going to end. They're going to listen to Trump's answer. And they're going to end this thing. For ha having another term here, is uh, that was that was just incredibly inspiring. But but I mean, what was it like for you? Not pleasant. I have <laughs> not to be pleasant. I said there was blood. <laughs> I had more blood. I didn't know fun. I had. I didn't know I had that much blood. Blood. There was so much blood. There was so much blood. You had any blood? We know what the the pictures are. Okay, so this was the total amount of blood. There was no blood on his suit, no blood on his collar. This was the blood. This was, you know, the ketchup that he had. No wound here, no visible wound, and there's blood that rolled down his face because they squirted it over here while he was cowering on his knees to a fake shooting while other people were standing up because, you know, maybe they didn't hear a bullet fire, whatever it was that happened there, whether it was CAI stuff or CGI or whatever was happening, the crowd... You know, I mean, the reaction. But there was, this is the total amount of blood. Very little blood. And it was dry because it's not leaking down his ear. It's not dripping here on his collar and his shirt. There's his ear, right? No, no damage here. No nothing, right? Just, I mean, there's nothing here. There's no evidence that there was any kind of damage to his ear. No reason for a trip to the hospital. No reason for that giant tampon they put on him. No reason for any of it, right? The giant maxi pad, the whole thing was a joke, a lie, a fraud. You know, a psychological operation. Years later told me that the ear is a place that is uh, a very bloody place if you're going to get hit. He didn't need stitches, right? But uh, It's a very it's, bloody place. There's gallons of blood stored in the ear. In this case, it was probably the best alternative you could even think about because it went at the right angle and, uh, you know, it was... Uh, I showed you that that was impossible from where they're, they're saying the shooter was. Like, the whole thing's a lie. There was no miracle shot. There was no miracle head movement. It was just didn't happen. Hard hit. It was very, uh, I guess you would say surreal, but it wasn't surreal. You know, I was telling somebody, you have instances like this or like a lot less than this where you feel it's a surreal situation. And I never felt that way. I, I knew immediately that it was a bullet. I knew immediately that it was at the ear. Yeah. And <laughs> Because, you know, it was part of the script. They told me this was going to happen, so pretend that you have to grab your ear and pull your hand down and pretend there was blood on it when there's not, and then hit the floor, and then we'll squirt some real blood on you, and you can do this fist pumping thing, right? You got it? Okay, it's very simple. Okay, grab the ear, get down on your knees, get up, pump your fist and say, fight 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 but don't say the words just mouth them so that like you know everyone can see you're saying fight but like no one's going to hear you say fight and remember don't say anything about your shoes like don't say something stupid like put my shoes on or can i get my shoes on because that's like well you know go ahead and do that because whenever we fake something there's got to be something with shoes so go ahead do the shoe thing because uh, it you know it hit very hard but hit the ear and i also heard people okay so zero sign of any of that right shout bullets bullets uh, you know get down get down because i you know i moved down pretty nicely pretty quickly and we had bullets flying right over my head after i went down so i'm glad i went down the the bigger miracle was that i was looking in the exact direction of the shooter and so it hit it hit me no you weren't because the shooter was off to your left and he shot you in the right ear which is impossible An angle that was uh, far less because destroyed. where you were looking there was a giant chart that you were pushing that was up there plus the crowd was there and the shooter didn't have any angle on you because the if he was behind he would have been behind the billboard and the chart and so the chart destructive than any other angle so that was the miracle that was yeah. for those people Split that second. don't believe in God I think yeah, we gotta all start thinking about that you have you to gotta start thinking about it. like don't, don't go too overboard don't pray to God or surrender to God or do anything you know find God in yourself and you know, connect with the divinity within you. Don't do anything like that. Just, you know, start believing because of the miracle shot that almost hit the ear. Just, you know, now you got to say, hey, maybe God does exist because Trump's miracle ear. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a believer. Now I'm more of a believer, I think, and a lot of people have said that to me. A lot of great people have said that to me, actually. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go over this again. We'll play this back, this whole thing, because it's just so fake, and I'll have more to say about that. Um, but, you know... Like, this is not a conversation we we're seeing. The, you know, again, a billion people listening to this crap. Come on. It's silly. And, like, they couldn't even get video, right? 
I mean, this is like you've been hacked, bro. Like, you, did someone ate your lunch? Is that what you're saying? Or you just do this on purpose? So the whole thing. Uh, but I want to get to the Olympics, and uh, i got maybe a few more things to get to here. Okay, Tuesday, August 13th here. I'll release this video probably the 14th of Wednesday. And I shot this stuff yesterday. Here's this guy called the Voyager. They dropped from the sky. Um, and this has implications to the next Olympics and the previous Olympics in Los Angeles, but also Tom Cruise. They had some blue and red houses. He was up there um, on the rooftop. And this was at the end. I didn't know. So I'm going to come back to this later. You see that he's bathed in blue and red here. But he's going to be, he's going to drop down. He's going to do a whole Hollywood thing. So I didn't understand this was at the end of the thing. But uh, let's get into the whole Voyager thing because it's, you know, it's very telling here. Okay, so this is the, the whole thing here. This is what she's about to say here. Think about what she's about to say. But this is the world map and they're going to drop this guy. They're calling the Voyager. And what they're attributing here is that some French guy years and years ago was one of the guys who was a key to resurrecting the old Greek Olympics and making it into a global thing that it is today. So the French are claiming that. And they're using this Voyager to kind of retell the story, but in a dystopian future. So listen to what this boop says here. So what we're about to see, guys, is a reimagining of that story in a dystopian future where there is no Olympic Games, but ultimately there is a golden Voyager who rediscovers and brings back the Olympic Games. So I don't have to show you any more, but I will. Like The Olympics is big on copyright, and I'm going to show you what I can. It's a whole thing. But just think about what the bitch just said, right? Like, And she's just told what to say, right? They, they've been given a script. This is their official story. Now, they tried to say that the Olympics wasn't about the, you know, the original Olympics. But we were told that the... The horsemen for the apocalyptic horsemen, there's two of them apparently. There's one that was the sort of guy who was a torchbearer, and they're going to show back up. And they look like two horsemen of the apocalypse. This is the horse, there's a guy who was the torchbearer. The other guy was the apocalyptic horseman that presented the Olympic flag to the, you know, Baal, um, you know, the god Baal the bull, right? And so, um, <laughs> all these things right and so it was completely apocalyptic but now they're talking about a dystopian world where the golden voyager is going to come down from outer space like these extraterrestrials are coming down to an earth that the human beings have destroyed as we go through these images these eyes wide shut images right all the moral uh, depravity and all the rest of it and so the human beings have destroyed planet earth and the aliens like well let's bring back the olympics like you know <laughs> the olympics is predicated on the kind of world the kind of people that we are now and so in a spiritually based world there would be no olympics because olympics is supposed to be sort of like a substitute for war and people coming together to compete but there's lots of rivalries and hatred and you know it's i mean it's aggression you know like this is competitive aggression and so this whole thing is silly right for them to come out and say yeah this thing wasn't dystopian and this wasn't uh, apocalyptic and they gave explanations for all these things and then they end the olympics by saying oh yeah that the world has been destroyed and we're in a dystopian world an alien comes down a golden alien and his first act is to go to revive the olympics but you can't do that unless you have countries right and you have all the things that there isn't going to be here when everything collapses and the, the collapse is here, right? They're talking about it quite openly. But now they're like, oh, in the future, somebody's going to come back and do this thing, right? Now, I don't think there's going to be Olympics in 2028. I think this was the last one. But there might be. We'll see what, you know. I might be saying the same thing in 2028 as we see this thing unfolding. But things don't look good, right? And so let's go through this Golden Voyager thing. And then we'll revisit the 1984 Olympics where they had a spaceship and all that stuff and what you know the, all the things that were you know the whole hollywood aspect to this and you know all of it right uh, but this is bad like this is you know the whole everything that this indicates is not good news and the depravity and the degradation here is you know is epic so this is when the golden voyager enters like listen to these noises right 
it's very alien-esque. Like, you hear all this stuff. This is like an alien coming into the... Okay, so you can see all the lights, and, you know, this is a light show, and here's when the Voyager's coming into the stadium, dropping down from the ceiling. It looks very much like the Predator, right? The Predator movie, some sort of golden god, whatever it is, doesn't look benign, right? It doesn't look like it's friendly. So it descends to Earth here, right? It's descending to the... Pl the dude eventually lands... See, interesting position he's coming down on. It looks like a Freemasonic position. And he lands in Africa, right? So there's the whole world um, in very oddly shaped, right? And very very, ag uh, very jagged, very uh, linear, not curved the way the Earth is. Very, you know, it's, it's all lines and it looks very kind of sharp and jagged original olympic games and spark a rebirth you know they think it's going to be like dystopia with snacks right like dystopia with benefits like no it's going to be dystopia right it's going to be a post-apocalyptic uh, post-apocalyptic world and what happens you're not going to give a shit about the olympics again very much looking like the predator and so the other thing i should say is there is a great video out there i think it's by an indian scientist called nature abhors metal and the only metals that don't break down are gold or rust or corrode or eventually break down are stainless steel which still has some issues right aluminum and gold and copper and so you know, all those you know copper gets this film on it right but nature is always trying to get rid of metals you know the age of iron right this is the the um this the kali yuga and so when aliens came down here, they took gold. Like there's whatever various space, you know, cosmonaut type of um, spaceship ride and aliens came down. Gold was valued, and that's why gold became so valuable. It was used by these extraterrestrials, right? And so, um, you know, anyways. So the horseman of the apocalypse, the pale rider, shows up carrying the greek flag the greek flag being the flag of the original olympics you know this, this is the choir going this takes forever the pale riders marching from one end and the other guy here the um this guy the flag bearer is marching from the other end and so this guy puts his pole down and the other guy puts his flag on it the greek flag just really pretentious and unnecessarily long and you know the olympics is fun and whatever it is right bad good whatever you think about it but it's not this right <laughs> it's not you know there's no there should be no reverence for it there's there's nothing spiritual about it right there's nothing that's um holy or exalted and you know all this pretentious shit they do in these ceremonies right it's not you know it's okay right it's it's okay it's good it's fun sports sports you know nothing nothing more nothing less Sports is a lot like politics, right? Sports is, especially big time sports, there's so much corruption and competition and, you know, just um, cheating and just all of it, right? The good, bad, the ugly. And then these creepy guys descend down and they help the Golden Voyager. They're all, they represent all the different events and they help the Golden Voyager rediscover the Olympics after the, we've completely fucked the earth over, right? <laughs> okay, so eventually the guy from France presents the, flag to the mayor of LA and Simone Biles is there and Tom Cruise had been all over the Olympics I was wondering why he was doing there and he ends up playing a big part here I got a, like a whole Tom Cruise story I'll tell I guess um, we can do that in a second um, so he um, takes a flag through the crowd and he's being really Tom Cruisey about it like over the top you know and he gets on a he rides a motorcycle real fast he gets on a plane like it's Mission Impossible. And then he goes to Hollywood and he puts up the the flag there with the Hollywood. So, that, you know, I guess that's, I don't know if that's the sign of Hollywood now. And there are a bunch of, like, demonic performances. At, and then uh, at the end of the Olympics, the woman sings, uh, I did it, we did it my way, I did it my way. The Frank Sinatra song, you know, the way that France was, like, you know, said, said a big F you, this big fuck you to everybody <laughs> with their opening ceremony, the closing ceremony. And then um, 
they have Billie Eilish and Snoop Dogg and the Red Hot Chili Peppers for some reason. They exhumed all these acts perform and you know the for this this handover to the LA group. I want to get to the Olympics. Here's um Snoop Dogg you can see here. He um he's got these these Egyptian dogs with the Snoop Dogg braids. And I talked about him being Anubis, but he was all over the whole thing. Um the whole Olympics, he was just everywhere and really annoying, just totally Snoop Dogg in it, right? You know, they're neglecting the fact that Snoop Dogg held a gun out to a, you know, a, cl a clown, a, you know, some Trump impersonator with a clown mascot and hit bang. You know, now that, of course, uh, you know, all that fake stuff with Trump. And so I'll get to the Tom Cruise um, story because it ties into France and my trip to India. But let's go to the L.A. Olympics in two 1984. This is from London in 2012. Remember, everyone thought the world might end in 2012. But then people were like, well, maybe the Mayan calendar said 2024. And you remember this weird baby thing they had? And they celebrated all the the villains. This is Voldemort. It was a weird thing to do. There's a guy, I forget his name, young kid. He ended up dying unrelated to this story. But he kind of broke the story. He went through all the the roads around the Olympic um you know, venue there in London, and they had all these weird names and all this Illuminati and, uh, you know, apocalyptic stuff. And so here's the Illuminati eye for these two boxers, these two dudes here, and then the Illuminati for um, the basketball team there. Is that American? I don't know. France, maybe. The Illuminati eye on these synchronized swimmers. But in 1984, at the, I think it was the close of the Olympic closing ceremonies i don't remember seeing this i was in high school at the time and it's kind of effed up look at how um well the whole thing is so fo so foreign so old-fashioned so they have this spaceship there there's the moon and an alien the comes alien out himself. that is no one on stilts that is a man seven I'm feet long eight long inches long tall long. So it looks like the Predator, right? So at the end of the Olympics, and this is the last time there was Olympics in L.A., there was an alien that came out of a spaceship. It was like, what the fuck? Like, it was just weird. For almost 100 years, you have celebrated the best that humanity has to offer. <laughs> it's talking to the audience. You call it the Olympic Games. And for that, and for the cities which have kept the Olympic ideal alive, I salute you. So they dropped a, they dropped a space. They have all these movies and, you know, all these science fiction movies and things and theories and stuff out there. Of course, I talked about this with the pyramids. The pyramids were obviously built by a higher level of intelligence and technology than we possess today. And there's, you know, all this evidence that there was varying uh, degrees of higher developed people, people that were considered gods, people with the ability for space travel and things like this, that have been on planet Earth that was doc documented in the, the history of the world, right, through the aboriginal cave art paintings. I've talked about this in the past, right, and here. And if you believe that there's a plan, now if you believe everything's random, you might be able to, you know, sell yourself this idea that the Earth is the only planet with inhabitable life. But if you understand that there's a soul, which is, you know, a, a highly ideal, uh, a highly evolved concept, the idea that there is an etheric aspect to our life, and it's beyond just our physical joys and pleasures and pains and suffering and experiences in our senses that there's something animating our bodies and when we die that essence goes somewhere else so that es so that essence is a different form of life your soul is a form of life you know and there's life forms everywhere across the universe right in varying forms if you believe in a soul then you believe that there's extraterrestrial life life that doesn't uh, the physical laws don't apply to is your soul not alive is your soul not a you know uh, an animate, uh, independent creation, right? So there's life, if you believe in any of this stuff, 
somewhere else. In physical life, there's going to be other planets where there's physical life. And, you know, there's all this evidence to support that. But they've tried to make people who believe in aliens and extraterrestrials crazy, and yet they keep on bringing it up and throwing it in our faces and bringing it in the Olympics here. You know, I read a Whispers of the Brighter World message where there's say there's going to be a need for an invasion at some point because human beings have gone off the rails, right? So there's all those things. And this is an accident. Like they had this very apocalyptic ceremony for France and just the way the world's going and the you know everything that's happening, the you know the degradation of the human consciousness and how stupid and idiocracy is setting in and uh, the immorality and the, de- the the deviant sexual behaviors and all this stuff that they demonstrated here. All these things that are going on and you know the degradation of humanity continues. And then the pol- politicians and all the anger and hatred, anger and hatred that's coming up and all the apocalyptic movies and all these things. It just feels like the apocalypse is upon us, right? The connection to Egypt, the Illuminati stuff, all these things. The pyramids. And so like it's happening, right? Like this is, you know, it, it's like the end of something, the end of our civilization. And whenever the civilization is always congratulating itself on its, all its achievements, that's when it's about to collapse. You know, it just feels like it's it's ending now, right? There's something like it's you know, it's over. I think people see a sense of that more and more. The poli- the politicians are saying we're trying to save democracy and save the soul of America. And you know, if this guy gets elected, it's the end. And you know, World War Three and just all of it, the rhetoric and all the things what's happening in Israel and just all the rest of it, and just everything we saw in the Olympics and we see on a, a daily basis on our, you know, our movies and TV you know, shows the degradation of the you know, consciousness and you know these kids growing up depressed and being very low functioning and you know all the ways that we're going in the wrong direction, and so the Olympics signifies all this. You know, I don't think there's going to be another Olympics, but. If there is, things are going to be completely different. Four years, (laughs) like, you know, just think about what it's, you know, just the idea of 2028, 2030. I mean, all the predictions from the World Economic Forum about people won't own anything and they'll like it and, you know, population reduction and another one in terms of the, you know, pandemic and all these things that they predicted and, you know, things look pretty bleak and they're moving in that direction rapidly and, you know, We'll see. But uh, this Olympics and the election, they're tied hand in hand, the whole thing. All these things are it's part of what I call the show. And so there was a story here I want to tell about Tom Cruise. I was going to tell it earlier. And so I was on that plane going to France, and that French guy who sat next to me and said, you know, is that um, you're going to see Chargy because he saw the picture of Chargy on the book that I put there because I was going to read the book while, while it was, you know, it's a nine-hour flight. And he was telling me how Tom Cruise saved the Sajmark system. Of course, many of you guys know the Sajmark system is now called the Heartfulness, you know, Heartfulness, whatever it is. It's, you know, it's a, it's a cult and it's, you know, it's degraded. It's what's happened to all these religions is now happening to this wonderful spiritual system I did for years. But back when, you know, I was doing it then, it was a wonderful system. It was a blessing in all ways. But what happened was, there was this French guy, and there was he was married to a preceptor who did, you know, his wife did the Sajmark system, and he started this thing. It's called Fordon, and he started ragging on Sajmark and Chargy, and he he was given access to all this information. He was like obsessed with it. Now the people in the Sajmark system think I'm like the the modern day Fordon. <laughs> you know, they and everyone listened like looked at this guy Fordon because he had information that other people didn't have. But he was very critical of the Sajmark system because his wife left him. And I know why his wife left him because he was like, you could tell what kind of guy he was from his posts. But he blamed his divorce on the Sajmark system and he got the Sajmark system put on, you know, uh, France was very, um, because of the immigration issues, had a cult list and were putting things on cults. And so the guy's telling me this story, right? This guy who's, he's a French guy living in England. And Tom Cruise was really loved in France, like beloved. Like Jerry Lewis was beloved. And he went to France, you know, with his, um, whatever, the Scientology thing he does. And he said to them, you know, you guys got to lighten up. 
and he convinced the government to get rid of their occult list. <laughs> and Neil Sajmarg had been a cult li- on a cult list, and all these people quit because it was on this list. Um, so you know, there's that. So there's a tie into this. I didn't expect that tie-in. I didn't when I started talking about that stuff in India. Um, Tom Cruise wasn't a part of my wasn't going to be a part of this video, but then I saw that he showed up at the you know I started doing uh, looking into it here. But anyways, you know, this is just a big, giant mess. The Olympics and the polit- political world, the show is, you know, it's getting interesting, but also it's showing sides of the, the foundation is cracking, right? And whatever way these narratives play out, whatever, whoever they select as president, however this plays out with World War Three, and, you know, the, I mean, they have to reduce your lifestyle. They can't, the scam is over. The money is just... The debt is out of hand, and the, you know it's everything's breaking down. You know I have more to say here, but I'm I'm wearing down here, so let's just move forward. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramount definitely born for the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day, and be grateful.